Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Calling the order, the Marine Fish Advisory Commission for the month of February, 2023. Uh, everybody is welcome. As I look through the agenda, I see there are no action items, just uh, public hearing discussion and discussion items. So has anybody comment on the review of February agenda. Jared, any hands? I'm not seeing any hands raised from the commission to comment on the agenda, Mr. Chair. And then we will move forward to uh, approval of the December 2022 business meeting minutes. Any edits, questions, remarks from hey, members? Raymond, I, I think we had a uh, hand up at um, from one of the attendees. I think it was Phil Coates has his hand up, maybe about the agenda. Okay, we'll bring it back to the public then. Phil Coates, you're recognized. The hand's down now. That, that might have been accidental. And generally, we're not taking comment from the public until the end of the meeting. My apologies. Thank you, Jared. Review and approval of the December 2022 business meeting minutes. Edits, comments, remarks from commission members. Any hands, Jared? I'm not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Well, I need a motion. I'll make the motion to approve the minutes. Thank I'll you. I'll second it. Thank you, Shelley. And who, who seconded? Bill Amaru with the second. Bill, thank you. We're going to need a roll call vote on this, Mr. Chair. Roll call vote. Bill Amaru. Was that me? Yes. Yes, and I vote yes. Bill Doyle. Yes. Cleo Bogdan. Yes. Lou Williams. Yes. Mike Pierdenock. Yes. Shelley Edmondson. Yes. That looks like the full commission, Mr. Chair, at this point, Sookie and Tim are currently not in attendance. Uh, so that motion passes unanimously. Thank you, Jared. Moving on, I would just like to welcome everybody and thank everybody for their attendance once again at this February business meeting. And I will turn it over to Commissioner Ron Amadon. Thank you. Good morning, Chairman Kane, and good morning to the board, as well as uh, all of the MF folks. Um, this uh, this past month, I had uh, the opportunity to visit the Cat Cove Marine Labs. Uh, hadn't had a chance to get out there in a couple of years. I uh, must say congrats are in order to uh, Director McKinnon and uh, Kevin Creighton, as well as Dr. Armstrong, for the work that they have done along with their staff. Um, very pleased to see how well they brought that thing back into uh, activity and uh, glad to see that it's fully staffed with DMF folks. Um, wonderful job on the restoration. I am uh, currently uh, collaborating with a whole bunch of other folks to try to find some additional funding so that we can bring uh, Cat Cove Marine Labs to its full potential. And um, I am very confident that uh, we will see substantial um, efforts being made on funding that program as it should be within the next year. Um, so again, uh, thank you to the staff uh, for doing the, the hard work of getting that thing cleaned up and getting it uh, back in action. So uh, congratulations to all. Thank you, Commissioner. Any other comments before I move on to law enforcement? Moving on to law enforcement, Lieutenant Bass. Hi, good morning, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Um, yeah, uh, not too much to um, to report, except for uh, we are obviously in the um, gear closure time of year I, I do see that as an agenda might have i think so some of it will be mentioned later but yes yeah, some of our efforts uh, i think the we are seeing a lot less gear out there i uh i'm not sure what the contract boats have 
hauled, although they have had an opportunity to get a couple of days in themselves. Um, some of the issues there is there is still some gears we gear out there. We might have a we might have a couple candidates for for Jared and an adjudicatory or some notifications later. But uh, probably one hiccup is um as you might know is the the wedge still seems to be a problem where um the waters around it are statutorily closed. But uh, Noah or Nymphs did make an emergency closure on the 31st of January, closing it on the 1st, which obviously isn't um, very reasonable, but they did uh, did ask people that had gear in the water to contact them and allow them a, a, a at this time, a 14 day window to remove it. Um, there are some rumors that, um, that uh, you know, people are getting citations or, or, or whatnot uh, for the gear in the water. I don't believe that's true. There was one person that I think took um, that, 14 day window to um, take advantage and say you can still fish the gear through the 14th when I think the intent was to get it out. So there are some people still actively fishing um, and, and that uh, I guess caused a little uh, some issues, but uh, there are uh, have been a bunch of whales in the area. Um, um, I think we have a couple entangled or on their way up here, not, not from mass gear or from the area, but previously entangled. So it's a, it's already shaped up to be a pretty busy whale season, but, um, beyond that, I don't think we have much else to report. If, uh, if there's any questions. Questions from Lieutenant Bass. Well, not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jared. Director Dan McKeon. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Commission. Good morning, everyone. And I want to thank everybody for attending this uh, peculiar time of, uh, of the week and time of day for the meeting. Um, I know it's the morning after the Super Bowl, but it's a little easier with the Patriots not in it now, isn't it? Um, the reason we moved it to today is I'm attending a, uh, a meeting Tuesday through Thursday of this week down in New York uh, with a bunch of other states putting our heads together uh, to put to devise what's being called as a, a regional fisheries compensation fund administrator. Um, and this is warranted because in the current arrangements, offshore wind developers are negotiating separately with individual states to devise compensation plans, even for fisheries that are taking place in federal waters that include vessels from uh, many states. Uh, it's really an in insufficient and inefficient approach because um, sometimes the arrangements made with different states are different. Um, sometimes state, including having some states that, uh, that get very little uh, uh, compensation for their vessels um, down, down the road. And so uh, BOEM, the, the Federal uh, Bureau of Offshore Energy Management, they've drafted guidelines for fisheries compensation. And we hope that uh, a bunch of states from uh, us all the way down to Virginia, we're putting our heads together to see if we could come up with kind of an informal arrangement where uh, all of the uh, all of the compensation packages going forward um, could be uh, handed over to a single entity with more common standards. Because right now, like for example, Vineyard Wind has its own uh, arrangements with Massachusetts, different than Rhode Island, and we're hoping for more consistency going forward. And this will be uh, just as important, uh, you know, five or ten years from now when the Gulf of Maine uh, starts to be developed as well. So we're looking down the road. Um, so that, and anyway, that's why we're meeting uh, on a Monday. Is I'm unavailable middle of this week, and um, and then next week school vacation. A lot of the staff are away. Uh, Next in my uh, report is the Shellfish Advisory Panel is scheduled to meet uh, in the first, uh, I believe it's March 2nd um, at, uh, soon. And uh, among the topics that we're going to be addressing is something that's come up briefly in past commission meetings, and it has to do with the state's Wetlands Protection Act uh, and its impact on the conduct of marine fisheries, particularly uh, surf clam hydraulic dredging. Um, we haven't dealt with uh, any amendments recently on the surf clam fishery, but I think there might be opportunities to do so in the future. But right now, uh, we're still um, uh, facing some very confusing jurisdictional challenges where uh, because of court decisions that were made back in 2015 and 16 and 17, uh, a court has determined that a municipality can regulate 
the conduct of this this activity in in some municipal waters uh, as if it were a dredging project. It's you know dredging meaning the deepening of a channel or harbor. Uh, uh, the in the absence of, of of good regulation or good laws to explain uh, the jurisdictions or to to um, to parse the the jurisdictions. Uh, the Wetlands Protection Act and our statutes are both considered in play or they're harmonized by the court decision. And this is creating an untenable situation where um, uh, we, we, in my opinion, uh, we need to have resolution on this because uh, it's, um, it's, it's resulting in some serious confusion and dysfunction. And so we're working with our shellfish advisory panel to come up with some recommendations for change. And we will uh, send this to you um, probably uh, when we send it to the shellfish advisory panel. So it's something to look, for you to look forward to because one of the recommendations is it does suggest that um, DMF and the commission might wanna manage our surf clam fishery uh, even once we grab that jurisdiction back, and I hope we do, um, we might want to uh, address things like eel grass beds and um, and keep the vessels out of sensitive areas, because uh, I, I think that's part of the problem. Uh, next on my agenda, I want to just say that we are in the process of gathering nominees for the two New England Fisheries Management Council seats that the governor will make recommendations uh, to the Secretary of Commerce. Those seats are John Papalato's seat, for which he is eligible for one more term, uh, John works the, uh, or he heads up the Cape Cod Commercial Fishermen's Alliance, and Elizabeth Etry uh, from Gloucester, who is involved with uh, the ground fish management and the Northeast Seafood Coalition. Uh, Elizabeth Etry's seat will be vacated because she's terming out this summer. And so we have uh, sent you as commission members uh, the bios of uh, four individuals that we feel are qualified and, uh, and suitable to serve as council members. And if you would like to weigh in on any of these nominees, uh, we'd ask you to do so before the close of business tomorrow. Any letters of support that we've received will be forwarded to the administration uh, with the nomination packages. So this process is an annual one for us. We either have a, it seems like every year we either have an obligatory seat or an at-large seat that's being vacated uh, on the New England Council. And the process starts out by us sending a notice to the general public saying, hey, these seats are available. If you're interested, send us um, you know, a, a resume and, and, and fill out the application. And then uh, we, we uh, filter those to the appropriate, you know, to qualified members. And then uh, we forward that to the governor's office who then, uh, will, uh, you know, compile all the information and ultimately re make recommendations about their ranked choice. Now, this ranked choice uh, may or may not be heeded by the Secretary of Commerce. Usually, the Secretary of Commerce takes the advice of, of any governor, but there are times, uh, uh, not only in Massachusetts, but elsewhere, where the Secretary of Commerce has, has opted for um, someone on the list, but not in the order of, of preference. But uh, you know, you folks are in a unique position as uh, uh, knowledgeable and and uh, experienced in marine fishery. So, uh, if you wish to include any kind of letters, we would we would put those in the package. Um, and this letter will uh, ultimately be it has to be sent by March fifteenth from the governor to the. Uh, Secretary of Commerce. And then finally, I want to uh, thank Ron for, for his praise of the Cat Cove Lab. And if I could, I'd like to recognize uh, someone that most of you have probably never met. His name is Brian Castingway, and he is our facilities guy on the North Shore. And he's uh, an amazing uh, individual with a huge skill set. Uh, our true jack of all trades, but also an expert in all things construction and HVAC. And so when uh, we put those RFRs, the request for response out to bidders, uh, Brian plays a huge role in that. And it, a lot of that progress wouldn't have been made without Brian. And he's one of these unsung heroes who's behind the scenes, uh, doesn't have a, a PhD, but uh, he probably is one of the brightest people that walks the halls of DMF. Anyway, so thank you for that. I'll take any questions. I am going to speak later in during the meeting on a bunch of other issues, as you know, Matt mentioned the wedge and things like that. So um, I have other things to say, but I'm, these are these are items that I won't be taking up later in the meeting. Thank you, Director McKeon. Questions for the director? Shucky Sawyer. 
Suki, you're recognized. Suki, you're recognized. Jared, have we got audio? I'm not getting any audio from him. Suki, you're recognized. Still not getting any audio from him. Well, we can come back to Suki with his questions for the director. Uh, let's move along on the agenda. Upcoming public hearing proposals, commercial summer flounder limits. Dan, who's going to cover this? Jared and I um, will uh, cover this primarily um, with, with any help from staff. Uh, we do have a slide that's going to come up on the screen that is uh, basically the, the cover uh, page of your memo. I want to point out uh, the memo that we have put together on this uh, on this issue is very lengthy, very detailed. Um, this and 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 the horseshoe crab memo is something that we spent an incredible amount of time on. Um, the The memo is long, but it's also reflective of how much work we put into it, including uh, meetings that began back uh, in the in December. We had a, a scoping meeting. We had a pair of them back, you know, back to back, and we brought the um, the summer flounder fishery participants together to um, to field their input on, you know, what what can we change? How can we fully utilize this these, this quota? You know, how can we make things more efficient? Um, because we do have an overriding concern that not only is our quota being underutilized, but we're seeing some pretty serious attrition in the uh, fleet of uh, inshore draggers. And if you go uh, back to the purpose of the report that uh, I worked on with uh, Story Read and the UMass Boston and the Cape Cod Fishermen's Alliance, you know, we, we really uh, tried to pull the curtain back on what's facing the, 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 commun the small community fisheries uh, the so-called port profile project where we examined uh, historical landings and value and um, tried to identify the challenges that the, the small boat fleet and the, the, uh, and the various fishing communities were facing. And so we know that there's uh, a decline in participation uh, in that fishery. And at a time when we're seeing increased quotas, we're seeing decreased participation, which is kind of a head scratcher. But uh, there are a whole lot of reasons that um, that fishing has become uh, more challenging for some of those folks. So we have kind of a five point plan here with with options. And um, the first one is uh, kind of a minor adjustment, which is to amend the offshore landing window, which uh, is, is is a minor one. It, that offshore landing window was developed back in the 90s when um, when the when the uh, you know the fleet was getting their limit rather quickly. Um, you know, it didn't make much sense for boats to be landing, you know, after eight o'clock because most boats got their limit by noon. And it was an enforcement enhancer. Um, but now with higher trip limits and and the 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 uh, uh, trend toward more fish and in and, and, and less uh, at, you know uh, accessible waters, you know, boats have to go further. Um, including the EEZ, and the fact that we allowed that pilot program where, where boats had more flexibility in their own schedule, where they could have uh, two days fishing back to back. Uh, it just makes more sense to give them some flexibility. So we're talking about a minor adjustment there of just two hours. And then for the summer fishery, we're talking about uh, either uh, creating a weekly aggregate program, much like the state of Rhode Island has done, where instead of having a daily limit, you know, we, we, um, allow the vessels to take the limits on a, that are calculated on a weekly basis. So it more or less does away with the daily trip limits, but puts a lot of emphasis and onus on the participants to disclose their, their fishing activities, uh, including, you know, vessel trackers, things like that. Um, 
or alternatively, if we don't go for an aggregate pilot program, we would simply increase the trip limits um, from the current 500 pounds to, to 800 pounds uh, with some uh, trigger-based mechanisms. Um, we, another minor one is bycatch allowance for the small squid, small mesh squid fishery. This particular um, uh, uh, adjustment uh, is simply one to prevent the fish from being forced out of state we uh, Jared's been feeling some calls from vessels that uh, that have reminded him that the federal rules allow um, the higher uh, amount when uh, not just uh, you know it's when using the small mesh it's not when the small mesh is in possession and we don't think this is a, a, a significant conservation issue because um, it's mainly about the uh, you know the, the post spring fishery Jared, do you hear me? I lost. I, uh, I do. It seems like we might have lost Dan's audio, um, but I can I could fill in for him here until he gets back. Um, so the next uh, item on here is um, increasing that fall trip limit October one to December thirty one, which is the offshore uh, fall fishery from three thousand pounds um, to ten thousand pounds when more than 5% of the quota remains. This is consistent with what the commission did by uh, declaration this past year. And similarly for the winter time, fish, winter time offshore fishery on uh, the period one fishery to increase that from 3,000 pounds to 10,000 pounds. That way the, the quota remains throughout the year. We're not changing shift trip limits for that, um, for that offshore fishery in season also consistent with, with what the commission did for 2023 at the last meeting by declaration uh, to get, kind of expand on three of the things that Dan was talking about prior to going back to the landing window. This was a request from uh, some of the fishermen and some of the dealers who were present at that December uh, industry meeting in New Bedford. Um, in recent years, as there's been, um, as we've documented, the attrition in this inshore fishery. The dealers are now sending fewer trucks to offload these vessels. Uh, these trucks are working down from you know, Stage Harbor in Chatham all the way down to Woods Hole in Falmouth, picking up fish from, from, from these boats and um, trying to coordinate um, those pickups with Cape traffic on the summertime and get this all done by 8 p.m. has just become um, you know, untenable. And it's causing kind of a rush to the dock to offload the fish. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we heard that, that would help kind of um, alleviate some of the, the tensions and, 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 and some of the issues of getting this fish in and, you know, kind of helping, helping the industry stagger, the, stagger these pickups and offloadings a bit more would be to um, either eliminate or... or um, you know, um, lessen the, the, the landing window. So we're going out to public hearing with a 10 p.m. landing window, but we'd be willing to hear, um, you know, comments in favor of, of extending that even further, you know, during the summertime, uh, the night closure to trawl fishing goes in a half hour after sunset. So, you know, midsummer, that's 9 p.m. So conceivably some of these vessels are being, their days are being even cut short by this landing window. Um, on the period two fishery, um, the two options, one would be an aggregate program. That's really to try to make the inshore fishery more efficient at taking their fish. Um, the second option to increase the trip limits, that's more designed to, to allocate or to encourage more offshore fishing to enhance the, uh, the, the usage of that quota. And lastly, the bycatch, which has been underutilized by between, you know, about 25 to 40% over the past four, year, four seasons. So you know, pretty sizable underages there. And then on the um, squid rule, uh, what we did a couple of years ago was made a rule that was more conservative, more restrictive than the um, federal uh, requirement um, for bycatch allowance of the small mesh 
summer flounder bycatch allowance of the small mesh fisheries. Um, the, the plan calls for a hundred pound trip limit if a vessel is fishing with small mesh. We went a step further and said that if you're in retention of more than 250 pounds of squid, then you are effectively fishing with small mesh and that you're subject to that 100 pound trip limit. That was really aimed at the inshore fishery to prevent um, some playing around, coming in with large mesh on the reel um, and while well, not having fish large mesh, but saying more than 100 pounds of summer flounder would caught with large mesh. What I heard from, from the offshore fleet this summer was that that was effectively forcing them to go to Rhode Island and offload their fish in Rhode Island uh, because they they were conducting trips with both net meshes on the same trip. And um, by virtue of that, they, they weren't able to land their summer flounder in Massachusetts. So they were just to go to Rhode Island instead. So in the name of trying to get fish caught by our vessels permitted in Massachusetts landed in our state, we want to walk that back and go with the, um, you know, the minimum requirement as established by the plan, which is any vessel fishing with mesh less than five inches is subject to a hundred pound trip limit. So those cover the five proposals and give a little bit more detail on the first three that Dan discussed. Um, Dan, are you back? I am. Yeah. Thanks, Jared. Uh, okay. I was able to get back pretty quickly and I do appreciate uh, you filling in some of the gaps in my presentation. Yeah. And of course, the memo is pretty deep in all of this. One of the things that we're, we're going to deal with is the intersection of this summer flounder fishery with the next issue that we'll talk about, which is the um, horseshoe crab fishery. So it's complicated, uh, but we're, we're doing our best to try to um, co-manage these in, in logical ways. So um, today's conversation, it can be brief. Uh, it can be lengthy if you want. Uh, it's it's your opportunity to to ask some some uh, clarifying questions, but uh, I, we this is what we intend to go to public hearing with. Um, and, uh, and and we'll get public comment on that. And then you folks can, as a commission, can vote uh, up or down. Uh, this this particular item today or or any other items that we're gonna talk about today, if, if you think we're completely out of line, uh, this is a good chance to tell us, um, you know, we could amend our, our final proposals, uh, you know, if they're really substantial. But I think that, uh, we've tried to address a lot of what we've heard from the constituents. And I, I think our package today has enough options and tries to address the items in, um, in a kind of a, a reasonable fashion. So, um, so I think Ray, if we, if people, if people want to ask it some clarifying questions, they should do that. No reason to, to talk about options at this point, preferred or otherwise, but um, if there's clarifying questions that people have, we'd be happy to take those. Yes, thank, thank you, Director. I was gonna recommend that we speak to these proposals one by one. So commission members, comments or questions about the commercial summer flounder rules that have been proposed or that are going to public hearing? Yeah. Right, and if you want to, or if anyone in the commission wants, it's in the memo, but I could also, if it's of interest, briefly describe the um, kind of the, the, the foundation of this pilot program and the conversation we have with the state of Rhode Island, who we're modeling this after. But I'll, I'll defer to the commission if they want to hear more details on that. It's all included on page five of the memo. Okay, thank you, Jared. I'll reiterate questions about this proposal from any commission members. Bill Amaru. William, you're recognized. Bill, you're recognized. Bill, you yeah. recognized. Am I, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, oh, okay, thank you, thank you, Ray. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't have any strong feelings. I mean, I have my opinions and you want us to give those at a later date, I, I can see, but I'm just a little confused by number three. I just don't understand exactly what we're talking about. I'm going to read it out loud. Maybe it'll help me adjust the bycatch allowance provision for the small mesh squid fishery rather than setting at 100 pound limit for summer flounder when fishing for small mesh. I think you mean when fishing with small mesh or when in possession of more than 250 pounds of squid have this limit only apply when fishing with small mesh. 
Um, sure, Bill. I, I don't know what that, that. What, what does that accomplish? Uh, you have no, to explain so, it simply. Let me clarify that. Last year, we amended the fluke. So historically speaking, on April 23rd to June 9th, our summer flounder limit for all gears was 100 pounds. Right. Beginning on June 10th, we opened up the so the directed summer, summer flounder fishery yep. at a higher limit. Um, and, and on that June 10th date, we also uh, prohibited the use of small mesh in state waters. So what we've, last year, you may recall, we, oh, we started the directed summer flounder season on April 23rd. So beginning on April 23rd, vessels could fish with large mesh for summer flounder or small mesh for squid. The, the, oh, that's you know. Yep. And in response to doing that, we said, well, maybe we want to put a additional layer on that bycatch allowance and say that if you're fishing with, not only if you're fishing with small mesh or if there's small mesh on the reel, you're limited to 100 pounds of summer flounder. But if you're in possession of more than 250 pounds of squid, then you're then the presumption is you're fishing with small mesh and you'd also be limited to that hundred pounds of summer flounder. And while that makes sense for the vessel, well that maybe don't make sense, but while that may make sense for the vessels fishing in the day boat fishery, because you might not be changing, you know, the the, the nets mid-trip to, to target different species given the length of the day. Um, for the offshore fishery, uh, who are taking multiple day trips at that time of year, um, you know, they were calling me saying this new requirement you've layered on, particularly after the state waters fishery closes, is limiting their ability to come into Massachusetts and offload fish because they're taking more than 100 pounds of summer flounder on those trips, which they're lawfully allowed to take um, under the federal plan, provided they're not fishing with small mesh while in possession of more than 100 pounds of summer flounder, or they're not fish, or there's not small mesh on the reel. So what, we're, what we want to do is walk that back and just establish the rule consistent with the FMP to allow that fish to be landed in Massachusetts. Does that make sense? It's a lot of words to, to uh, digest. I, I'm beginning to see what you're talking about. I mean, I've always understood the 100 pound limit. I just don't see the the difference between what's been done, except that you say that it, it'll encourage boats to land in this state rather than Mass in Rhode Island, and that's good for yeah, us. Yeah, well, vessel so. fishing offshore south of the islands after the state waters fishery closes yeah. can lawfully possess more than 250 pounds of squid and more than 100 pounds of summer flounder under the federal rules. Yeah. If but now they can't come in and land that in Massachusetts. Right. Because layered on this this squid possession limit to the 100 pound bycatch rule so we just want to unwind that so that that fish can come into our ports all right well you don't want to hear feelings concerning the options that are for instance in number two there's an a and a b you want to have that come at a later time after you've had public hearing i'll defer to the director well, Bill, if you want to point out to the commission kind of what the debate will be, because I'm, I'm kind of on the thinking about right. just for the for those not familiar with our uh, yeah. fisheries, it, it yeah. always helps to okay. um, to lay out like what what the arguments will be. And I, I think you have a really good feel for the fisheries down there. Why don't you go ahead? Yes. In conversations I've had with the fishermen about this, the majority of the fishermen who fish in Nantucket Sound strictly and do not access offshore waters because of the size of their vessels. They feel that the increase to the 800 pound limit is going to be very, very positive for them. But having the weekly program come into effect will change the nature of the inshore fishery. It will then allow much larger boats. And you know, we have a 74 foot ma ma a a maximum limit. Uh, those that size vessel and below uh, would have an impact on the inshore fishery that we may be regretting over time. And um, that is one of the comments that I've heard considerably. I've also heard from the uh, the production um, shoreside facilities that the increasing amount of fish and, and utilizing our quota fully would be a benefit and it certainly will be. However, if you look at the period uh, one and period two 
increases from three to 10,000, those offshore vessels definitely get a big plus and a big kick out of those increases. So it's not as though they're taking a, a particularly hard hit if we keep the limit to 800 pounds in the sound. That's, that's the thing that yeah. I would like to propose. Yeah. And, and one other thing, I don't see it on here and it's probably not gonna happen this year, but it's about time that, that the division looked at the possibility of allowing uh, the gillnet fleet at fishes in the canyon area in the winter and spring when those fish are moving up through the, those waters heading inshore to allow some retention and to be landing in Massachusetts under a limit. Uh, because right now, and in the last decade or more, there's been a lot of fluke caught in gillnets that has not been able to be landed. And I find that a real shame. They're not directing on them. They're just a handful of fish that are caught. And it would be great to add a little bit uh, to the stock by allowing these guys to bring these big fish in. Bill, is that because they don't have permits? It, it, it's partly because of that. I don't know of oh. anybody that's got, I don't know a lot of people that have got fluke permits that would allow that in state waters, but uh, mm -hmm. it's it's just part of the fishery that's evolved and uh, this fishery is fairly new it's it's been going on for about 10 years and it's carrying a considerable number of boats from our region mm -hmm. the, the outer cape and cape cod waters and i don't know how many to the west i'm sure there's some out of rhode island as well yeah. and, and maybe out of uh, western massachusetts ports but um, it, it is an ongoing problem and it, and i hate i just hate to see fish thrown back in the ocean dead that yeah. well, that's that's fair. And I appreciate your comments on that, Bill, just so you know that we have had uh, numerous um, like end of the year meetings, uh, you know, with this fleet over the past few years. And on numerous occasions, we've really struggled to get support for even increasing the trip limit. So uh, because of that same argument, oh, the out of town boats are going to be taking the fish, et cetera. So I think this is progress. And if, if you're reporting to us that there is support to go to this larger trip limit, um, that's really encouraging because it makes our job easier. And as far as the the uh, the aggregate program, it's certainly going to be more work for us. And uh, and if the if the rank and file um, you know fleet prefers just the trip limit, um, you know that we'd certainly consider that. Even though the memo says it's our preferred option, uh, it's our preferred option because we think it's going to you know it could uh, it could help the fleet. But if the if fleet um, is comfortable with just the higher trip limit. Um, you know, we'd, we'd certainly welcome that too. Okay, thank you. Those are my yeah. comments. Thanks for that background. Thank you, Bill. Questions for the director. I'm not seeing any other hands raised, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jared. And we can move along on the agenda. Commercial and biomedical horseshoe crab management. I think we need to change the screen, Jared. It to... should be changed. Okay, there you go. All right. Well, um, this is probably the most significant uh, proposal that we're coming forward with in this uh, year of, of um, regulatory changes because uh, we are talking about uh, some significantly, uh, you know, some significant new rules to. to doing things we've never done before. Um, we're talking about creating a new permit. We're talking about also issuing uh, uh, or limiting that the issuance of that permit. We're talking about uh, possibly closing the month of May for spawning protection. We're talking about creating a first ever biomedical quota. Uh, before I get into the, the specifics, um, actually, I'll probably have Jared get into the specifics here, but um, I just want the commission to know like what's most significant here. And I, I think uh, in my mind, it's the, um, it's the, the fact that we, we want to cap this biomedical harvest uh, to uh, something that approaches uh, the most recent levels, 2022. We're trying to be proactive. Um, we're trying to be responsible fishery managers, and we don't want us to be accused 10 years from now for failing to see the obvious. Um, when a when a fishery um, you know changes, when I say fishery, I mean like the when the when the when the fleet, when the markets, when all the when the participants all go off and 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 have a completely different um, uh, different approach, um, and result and when the mortality rate rates change, I think we have to be um, wide wide eyed and 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 um, prepared to 
uh, address that. And I, in my mind, that's what we're seeing here. We saw the introduction of a new biomedical firm in 2022. Uh, we saw, you know, unprecedented levels of uh, directed fishing by auto trawlers in order to meet the the needs of this new company. And you know, what we want to do is we want to, you know, uh, hit a little bit of a pause. We want to kind of lock in that level of harvest. Um, until we can determine, you know, in, in the future, you know, if there's actually room for expansion. Um, otherwise, uh, I, th I think we would be um, causing undue mortality on this stock. Now, no other state has a biomedical quota. Not, that's not quite true, Rhode Island does, but Rhode Island, it's my understanding that the, the quota is, is nominal and it's, and it's, uh, it's, it's not, uh, something that is shared by, by by multiple companies, and so um, what we want to do here is we're trying to um, create a biomedical harvest quota. Uh, we assume that 15% of those uh, crabs are not surviving the the experience of um, of being harvested, of being uh, bled, and 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 being released. Uh, that number is always debated, but I think it's a reasonable number at this point. And we think that given the growth in the biomedical harvest, that we think it's appropriate to um, take some of the bait harvest uh, to cover some of this increase. Uh, I use the number like six to one. And what I mean by that is six to one is about the ratio of a, a dead biomedical, for every one dead biomedical, I'm sorry, for every one dead bait crab, you can conceivably take six biomedical if you have about a 15% mortality rate. So this 200,000 crab quota that we're proposing is not um, 200,000 dead crabs. It is uh, about 15% of that. And you know we do recognize the value to, to society that this, uh, this product brings. And we need to be mindful of that as well. Um, so Jared, why don't you go through the, the details of these five proposals? They are new, um, much of them are new and, and they are significant and we'll, we'll take some quest, clarifying questions from the commission. Sure, so I think most significantly would be the, the, the changes in quotas. And as Dan said, what we're trying to do is, is, is lock the fishery in at recent levels of mortality. At present, um, there's no factors limiting the growth of the biomedical fishery in Massachusetts. We have a quota and a limited entry scheme for the bait fishery. We have nothing like that in the biomedical fishery. All we have in the biomedical fishery is a thousand crab trip limit a day, and that's not a biological metric. That's basically a, um, a metric that was designed based on the capacity of hand harvesters in a single day. Um, so what we did is we looked, we, we believe the horseshoe crab fishery is, is healthy where it is occurring at present. Uh, we've had pretty much steady state mortality for the past decade. During that period, we've seen trends in our two surveys that assess the abundance of this, the, the local abundance of this animal, both the, the, the trawl survey and the beach surveys. Um, you can see that I think it's figures two through figure seven in your memo. Um, you can see that those trends are, are generally improving. Um, so we think that at present exploitation, uh, this fishery is sustainable for both bait and bio biomedical harvest. What we are concerned about is we saw exponential increase in <clears throat> biomedical harvest this past year, uh, which was somewhat offset by reduced harvest in the bait fishery. Um, I think the bay fishery only took about 134,000 crabs, which is 30,000 crabs less um, or fewer than the um, quota allows for. So we're, we're saying, okay, there, there, there are several issues we want to investigate further. Um, you know, biomedical mortality, particularly pre-bleeding mortality um, that, you know, due to trawl harvest, um, Har harvest of molting crabs, penning, um, the sublethal effects of, of bleeding and penning, that we want to put a pause where we are right now until we can better understand some of these other items that, that, that complicate the management of this species. Um, and, and to do so, we would establish a 200,000 crab quota 
for the biomedical processors. Uh, the proposal is that that quota would be evenly distributed among all permitted processors. At this point in time, we have two permitted processors, or we will have two permitted processors. We're creating a new permit for these processors. Um, we currently put them into a bait permit category. We want to move that to a, a specific permit for this activity, a biomedical processor permit that Dan can then limit, or Dan or a future director can then limit issuance of in the future. Because we don't want to limit issuance of bait dealer permits in the Commonwealth because they're used for any number of bait dealing activities. So this the, the permanent activity needs to be more specific so that we can limit issuance in the future. And that prevents the pro proliferation of new firms coming into Massachusetts, as well as the use of satellite firms by the existing firms to game the quota so they can get more crabs. Um, hey, Jared, could I just interject, just yeah. so for the commission's edification, the 200,000 crab limit uh, would not be a limit necessarily on on how many crabs they could process it would just be on how many crabs they could process of from massachusetts caught for biomedical purposes those companies would still be uh, able to import crabs from uh, out of state and they could also bleed crabs that were otherwise destined for the bait markets correct uh thanks for that clarification um so then to counter that, the, the establishment of that 200,000 crab approach or 200,000 crab quota for the biomedical pressure, we're looking to reduce the bait quota by 25,000 crabs to offset some of that impact, which would effectively now limit the bait quota at 140,000 crabs, which is approximate to where harvest has been in recent years. Oh, I'm sorry, I moved that slide. Give me one second here. And that approximates where harvest has been in recent years. Um, I think a few years in the past five, it's been above that. But for the most part, our bay fishery going back the past 10 years has um, landed, you know, less than 140,000 crabs. Uh, there's, you know, four years in the past 10 year time series where we've landed uh, more than that. That's in table one in your memo. So this would, cap the bait fishery um, at 140,000 crabs, less than what it took last year, in line what it's taken in the past 10 years um, on average. And you, we, we think, you know, given some of the reports coming out of the, the fishery this year, that that's sufficient to meet local uh, whelk pot demand. Um, so that those are the proposals that are designed to cap fishing activity at its current levels. Um, layered on top of this is a new conservation proposal, which is to adopt a May 1, a January 1 through May 31 closure to all horseshoe crab harvest in Massachusetts. And in doing so, rescind the five day lunar closures around each new and full moon from mid April to mid th through June. So at present, every new, the two days before every full and new moon, the day of the new and full moon, and the two days after the new and full moon, from April 16th to June 30th are closed to horseshoe crab fishing. We would lift those closures and replace that with just a blanket January 1 through May 31 closure. Uh, May is the um, primary spawning month for this animal. Uh, according to our beach surveys, both north and south of Cape Cod, we would achieve, a, you know, we would protect about 85% of spawning animals by closing the month of May. Uh, to all horseshoe crab harvest. Uh, you know, you get that rest of that 15% to get you from 85 to 100. If you close June, uh, you get about, you know, half of it by closing to June 15th, half of it, and then the remainder of it by going to June 30th. We think the trade-off there um, is not warranted to close all the way through June because it would effectively eliminate the hand harvest fishery um, and, and it would make it more difficult for us to meet our bait demands in state. Uh, it would also negatively impact the biomedical fishery, the, the bio, not the biomedical fishery, the biomedical processors, who um, some of whom rely on those bait crabs for um, for the rent to crab program. Uh, so we think that you know May 31 gets us a lot of uh, spawning protection. Um, 
and um, continues to allow beach harvest in June and, and meet bait and biomedical demands. Um, you know, a, a blanket closure was an approach that we were petitioned to take um, by the uh, Horseshoe Crab Conservation Association. Um, and I believe their petition was attached to your memo. Um, then there are number three responds to concerns raised by the bait industry this past year and, and the commercial fishing industry this past year. And it's twofold. We heard from bait dealers during the season um, that the presence of this new biomedical firm and the increased reliance on trawlers to meet the biomedical demand is resulting in attrition from the bait fishery as a number of vessels who previously took place, took part in the bait fishery, were switching over to the biomedical fishery. And the bio, the bait fishery dealers felt that they couldn't compete with the biomedical fishery. Uh, because of the difference in trip limits, a thousand crabs on the biomedical side, 300 crabs for trawlers on the uh, bay fishery side. So, you know, we're asked to consider increasing the trip limits. Given the loss of May and the likely result that we'll have on the loss of hand harvest, um, you know, and harvest from other gear types, but predominantly hand harvest during May, um, you know, we think that we could probably increase that bay fishery trip limit. Now, it's a balancing act here because we want to utilize this horseshoe, the available horseshoe crab quota, but we want to do that throughout the period when the summer flounder fishery is open. So we, we don't want to end up taking this big crab quota so early in the season that we're regulatorily discarding horseshoe crabs later in the year. We want to, we, we want to be able to have these crabs available, you know, throughout the season for the, uh, primarily for the rent to crab program. We want to take the quota to meet the local bait demand. And we want to be able to do this throughout the period of time that the summer flounder quota is open. So it's a balancing act to try to figure, you know, at what trip limit can we, you know, make this profitable for the bait harvesters while at the same time ensuring that there's enough crab quota to get us through at least the end of the summer flounder fishery, if not, through the end of the year as there are, um, you know, shellfish dredge boats who do take horseshoe crabs as a bycatch as well. Um, so, you know, we're, we're looking to increase the um, trawler limit from 300 crabs to 500 crabs and the hand harvest limit from 400 crabs to 500 crabs to recoup some of that harvest lost in May. Um, or to set them at a limit higher than they are now to recoup some of their harvest in May and balance harvest so that the quota is available throughout the season. Um, item B here deals with letters of authorization. Historically, DMF would issue letters of authorization to any individual who held a coastal access permit or fluke endorsement who did not also hold a horseshoe crab permit to authorize the retention and landing of horseshoe crabs in that Nantucket Sound trawl fishery, um, consistent with whatever the trawl limit was. Uh, we did this for a number of years, uh, and it wasn't until, and while well, it irked some of the members of the trawl fishery who had horseshoe, who had invested in a horseshoe crab permit, uh, it really became problematic in 2019 when we took the entirety of the horseshoe crab quota. Um, and they asked us to eliminate this LOA because the horseshoe crab quota was taken in August and that they were discarding horseshoe crabs throughout August and September after this quota closure while they were continuing to trawl for in that mixed trawl in Tucking Sound fishery. Um, so what we did is we implemented a 75 horseshoe crab incidental limit for, per, for that class of permit holders that doesn't have the horseshoe crab endorsement, but is mobile gear fishing in Nantucket Sound. Um, we're trying to accommodate, you know, reductions of regulatory bycatch or regulatory discarding rather, um, and, and let them land something so that all those crabs aren't going overboard, you know, after, you know, being trawled up in a net or a dredge and, and then discarded. Um, now, as we've discussed with the summer flounder fishery, uh, there is attrition in this mobile gear fishery in Nantucket Sound. 
Uh, there are fewer participants now than there have been. We're down about 50% over the past decade for a number of economic and environmental reasons that we've, we've dealt with at prior meetings. Um, of the remaining group of vessels, you know, 15 or so vessels, maybe two to five in any given year don't currently have a horseshoe crab permit. Um, you know, that number fluctuates depending on who, who may or may not go and pursue other fishing opportunities. There's pretty much two consistent boats that are active in this fishery uh, that don't have a horseshoe crab endorsement, and three that may come in in any given season. So, you know, we want to try to make the boats that are remaining in this trawl fishery as profitable as possible to maintain this trawl fishery moving forward. Um, you know, given the attrition that's occurred in the past 10 years, we want to keep those vessels that are continuing to work that fishery, working that fishery. And, you know, to do that, you know, we need to make it profitable, we need to make it efficient. Um, so, you know, we'd be, we're considering, given the small number of vessels um, that are involved in this, giving them a letter of authorization um, for this season to, you um, retain horseshoe crabs at an elevated level above that 75 crab limit approaching whatever the trawl limit is set for the permitted harvesters. Um, and this will be a stop gap um, as we will probably convene the subcommittee on permitting within the next four to eight weeks to discuss potential um, proposals that we can take out to public hearing for 2024 to increase the transferability of some of our permits so that these individuals who don't have permits um, can, can become permitted to participate in this fishery. Um, then the last two items, um, they're, you know, reporting, given um, the importance of collecting, well, generally speaking, we wanna move all of our commer state waters commercial fisheries to daily electronic reporting um, as soon as possible um, across all the commercial fisheries. We're looking to do this on the first on the fisheries that we think that we need the data um, in the most timely fashion from. And you know that so here we're proposing for the horseshoe crab fishery to do this for 2024. And the next segment we'll also be proposing it for the Menhaden fishery. We think collecting timely data from the participants of those fisheries is critical for the management of these fisheries moving forward. Um, and, and they'll provide that first stepping stone to doing that for the broader commercial fisheries. Um, so that would be a requirement we'd look to do for 2024. Obviously we can't do that for, for this year. Um, we're gonna need to do some outreach, some education. Um, and you know we, we are comfortable that if we get this in place for this May, that we could do that outreach and education over the course of the year and get these folks reporting on, on their phones. It's a pretty, pretty simple application to work with. Uh, the last thing here is permit conditions. Um, we have regulated this biomedical fishery for as long as I can remember via permit conditions um, with limited uh, rules on the books and regulation. Um, with the growth in this fishery and increasing concerns from the public about this fishery, uh, we need to manage this in a more transparent manner. Um, you know, ex trying to explain to people what permit conditions are and how they how they differ from regulations and where they can find this information um, is, is really difficult. I mean, historically, it made sense from the management perspective because it allowed us to tweak things kind of on the fly in season to address emerging concerns. Um, but given the um, evolution here where we're looking to to regulate this fishery more transparently be able to show the public here are biomedical horseshoe crab regulations you know here they are 322 cmr 6.346 um you know we'll retain the right to to manage as necessary by permit condition to address you know emerging issues but we want to do the bulk of it um which is you know the handling practices uh, the live release practices, um, uh, temperature control practices, those things that are established by best management practice in the ASMFC 
FM or but through the ASMC Horseshoe Crab Board on this, uh, we want to adopt those as regulations. Uh, so that basically covers it. The one additional thing I'd add is that, or the two additional things I'd add that I think I missed touching on were that the um, the spawning closure, would, if we move away from the lunar closures to the blanket closures, given the timing of this, that would likely be for 2024 because I can't see these rules going in place before May 1. Um, so we'd likely retain the lunar closures for this year. And then if, if approved, move to that blanket closure um, for 2024. And on the permitting thing, we've already done permit renewals for this year. Most of the businesses who are involved either as biomedical horseshoe crab dealers and biomedical horseshoe crab processors have already renewed their permits. So for 2023, we will issue them just a new paper permit free of charge. That's in addition to the permits that they've already applied for to cover, to, to get that on the record for this year. And then in our permitting database, we'll create this new permit for 2024. And those will be established as wholesale dealer type permits rather than bait permits. So the permit fee as a result of that will increase from 65 to $130 annually. Dan, did I miss anything? I don't think so, Jared. It was very comprehensive. And you know, just as a reminder to the commission, this is a very complicated uh, fishery. Uh, I would concede that, but uh, we think it's fairly well managed. I think a lot of the critics who think we um, aren't managing the fishery sufficiently simply don't understand it. Um, when you look at how the interstate plan is structured, the biomedical harvest has never been capped. Uh, there was it was intended to be a a percentage limit uh, in the original plan when when the biomedical estimated mortality was supposed to uh, reach a, a percentage of the overall take. There, it was supposed to be constrained, but um, the the interstate board uh, has never. Um, taken any action in, in that regard, primarily because uh, there wasn't uh, growth. There wasn't necessarily growth in that sector. It was mainly because the bait harvest uh, numbers were, were declining. So there is clearly a an allocation issue at stake here, and um, and we think we've we've done a lot of um, upfront work, and we think we understand the issue. So we're really looking forward to the hearing to get the the public's feedback. It's difficult to satisfy. The, the demands, the needs, the desires of such a diverse sector. Uh, horseshoe crab conservationists on one side, and then we've got the, um, the commercial fishing bait interests along with the, the biomedical uh, uh, industry interests, and then the intersection between those two in the rent -a crab program. So I will confess it is complicated and, and I really would ask the, the commission to try to, um, try to wrap your head around some of these complicated issues and work with us to make this uh, the, the best fishery it can be. And, and as we kind of move forward and, and improve it in, in ways that we think are necessary at this time. So Ray, um, at this yeah, time, me, I guess we could take some clarifying questions. Dan, let me just add one more thing on the permitting. All right, be so quick. So yeah, sure, there's two permitting types. There's a biomedical processor permit which would allow for the processing of crabs as well as the primary purchase of crabs from a fisherman as well as a, a biomedical fisherman as well as the obtaining of crabs through a biomedical dealer, through a bait dealer, through the rent a crab program or through another state. So that would encapsulate the kind of what the, the, the range of things that the biomedical firms are doing now. They're processing crabs, they're obtaining crabs directly from biomedical harvesters and then through obtaining crabs with biomedical dealers, uh, bait dealers, and, and through entities in other states. Um, then the biomedical dealer permit would just be limited to obtaining crabs directly from biomedical harvesters. So that, those would be those entities that are currently functioning as like the middlemen between the harvesters and the processors. Yeah, and Jared, do you want to mention what was special about 2022 from the memo, the fact that we can reveal these numbers. I think that's worthy of uh, re-emphasizing. If you want to. Um, so historically the biomedical fishery, the, the, the data in that fishery has been um, held as confidential 
Um, you know, whether that's harvest data, number of crabs harvested, number of crabs bled, uh, sex of crabs, or all of the data comprehensively has been held as confidential because there have been fewer than three dealers working in this fishery. Uh, while we may have more harvesters, we've always had fewer than three dealers. Uh, when applying the rule of three, we can't release that data in summary. Uh, in 2022, what happened is that more than three dealers were involved at buying biomedical crabs from biomedical harvesters. As a result of that, the biomedical harvest data is not confidential under the letter of the law for 2022. Um, so I think the biomedical harvest um, was 170 something thousand crabs uh, this past year. Uh, all the remaining data provided, um, you know, number of crabs bled, mortality, crabs bisect, that remains confidential because again, there are only two entities who are providing that data to us. So those two biomedical processors working in the state were utilizing these subsidiary dealers to obtain crabs. And those crabs by, were reported by those dealers to us. And by virtue of that, and there being more than three um, dealers active this year, um, the harvest data and only the harvest data um, is non-confidential. So Jared, just one final point. Um, this doesn't mean this is a permanent change in our treatment of these data. So if in 2023, we only have two biomedical crab buyers, that data will become confidential again. Correct. Yeah, that was so, just a product of the way the fishery was conducted this year. Which I just want to say to the commission and the public, uh, you know, who might be listening in, if this is a one-time opportunity for us to reveal that number, create what we think is a, a, a credible approach based on those landings. And, and um, you know, I think one of the our bigger challenges here is um, the fact that this confidentiality uh, standard kind of hung over, over our disclosing of a lot of information on this fishery. And I think it breeds a fair amount of mistrust. Um, and so this, this opportunity for us to reveal the data uh, for 2022 may not be repeated in the future, but uh, it won't change the overall quota. That, that quota is going to be, if, if, if enacted, this quota will be established um, into the future until we amend it. So anyway, it's it's kind of an important point, especially for the biomedical firms. I know there's uh, there's some uh, level of anxiety that we've we've kind of uh, detoured away from treating this data as confidential. But um, you know the, the the rules allow us to do this. And I think it was fortuitous because now we can um, sort of pull back the curtain at least for one year and uh, and defend the harvest levels and manage uh, accordingly going forward. So I'll I'll stop. I know there's a few hands up and um, you know, let's let's have the commission ask some qualifying or clarifying questions if you want, Ray. Yeah, so Jared, you're seeing the raised hand, so you can call on the individual commission members. Bill Amaru. Bill, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Jared and Dan. Very comprehensive overview. Complicated, yes, but I've heard the expression, until we have a better understanding of the resource, numerous times through the discussion. And I don't see number six under proposals. And I think number six needs to be a comprehensive observer program that will be designed to gather information on the biology, the availability, the harvest techniques, and the handling of these crabs. It's not going to be a difficult thing to do. It's going to take some time and some dedication, but we've got to include an observer program on this. The crabs need to be observed from the time they're taken out of the water. <clears throat> until they return back into the water. And until we have a handle on that, I just don't see how we can talk authoritatively on any, at any level of, of what we're doing with these crabs. Because the, the current uh, assumed mortality rate of 15% simply is, is based on, I don't know what, it's based on something I'm sure, but it's not based on the facts of the fishery as I see it. And I think an observer program, not only to determine mortality, but to determine things like where is spawning going on, where are the crabs being taken, what are the depths, uh, so many different things. And a good observer program has got a lot of uh, uh, evidence in the back 
in our, in our, his, our history of producing information that makes sustainable fishing. And number six should be an observer program to observe the activities of the fishery and the crabs. Those are my comments. I have a lot of other ideas, but those, for the sake of time, you did say, please be brief. I'm not gonna get into those at this time. Yeah, so Thank Bill, you. I'll respond to that. Um, yeah. What we're bring, bringing forward to you today is that which um, we have to get your, your approval in order to enact, but certainly I, I agree with you and I, I would um, expend uh, what DMF resources that we could muster to pay more attention to some of these questions. I haven't put a price tag on that yet. That's maybe something that we would ask the legislature for assistance on once we do, but um, certainly we have a, a fisheries dependent investigations program where we could get some uh, level of observer data, but it might also require some some uh, you know uh, dedicated studies, which you know I don't think are going to be accomplished in one year. But um, I take your point, and uh, I, I am interested in doing that. And I have a feeling that there's a a pile of constituents uh, you know out out there in the public, and maybe even listening in on this meeting, who would like to see us do that as well. Yeah, I hope the rest of the commissioners see the value in this, and we'll uh, work together with you to see a program come into effect. Thank you, Bill. Jared? Khalil. Khalil, you recognize. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I, I, was, I was gonna uh, say exactly, not exactly, but uh, the, the sentiments that Bill just previously has, uh, has outlined, I think that's a, it's an important part of the, of the uh, process of, of uh, dealing with these horseshoe crabs. We talked about a 15% mortality and uh, and you may have said this, uh, Dan. I'm not too sure, but uh, is is the is the 15 percent uh, the total from the harvest to the bleeding back to the adjacent territory that the crabs are going to be put back in? Uh, I'm not sure if this 15, where this 15 percent number what it represents. Is it a total mortality? Is it a handling mortality from the harvesters? Is it a part of the mortality from the from the uh, biomed uh, uh, companies, uh, can you can you kind of? Yeah, I think it's it's what the the technical committee uses at the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission um, to apply to all biomedical harvest. I believe Derek Perry is on the call. So uh, Jared, why don't you recognize Derek? He can he's our representative on the TC. Can you guys hear me? Good morning, Derek. Hey, how are you? So that that fifteen percent is based on the number of crabs that are bled. It's um, applied to the number that are bled. It's there's a number added onto that if there's crabs that are found dead at the facilities before they're bled. So it's fifteen plus whatever is found dead previously. So I guess the answer to your question, Khalil, is that it it's it's a minimum minimal number. And I guess if there is some related mortality attributable to the harvest method that, or crabs that don't even make it to the plant, um, then that number could be higher. So Derek, um, if a number of crabs were to die on board the vessel prior to being landed or during penning prior to being bled, those would not be counted to the 15%, is that correct? It would be added on to the 15%. If observed. Correct. Khalil, does that help answer your question? It, it, it does, it does. And I think that's important to, I think that 15% and, and Dan said it, and uh, and I appreciate uh, the, um, the clarification, but uh, it needs to be just, uh, said that that 15% is the, is the minimum mortality. And that in reality, and, and we're dealing with living organisms, reality, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming that, um, that the percent would probably be even higher. Uh, this was a very comprehensive piece of work that uh, DMF has put out, and it's um, it's really covered a lot of a lot of territory. And I thought it was very comprehensive and well done. Um, but I do think it needs to be noted that that fifteen percent um, is probably the minimum amount, and it's probably a greater mortality, you know, from the harvesting, the steaming into the where they're going to, the collectors are going to be, and, and it's just that, um, 
and it has nothing to do with this 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 uh, document that was produced. I just think it needs to be understood that uh, my feeling that the fifteen percent is probably on the low end or the minimum end. But thank you so much. Thank you, Khalil Jared. Shelly Edmondson. You're thank rocking. Thanks, Ray. Um, I just had a question about the permits, and I was trying to understand that a little bit more. Do we currently have a permit for biomedical harvesters? We do, yes. So, and we know how how many biomedical harvesters we currently have. Correct. Um, and then we also know how many um, bait harvesters we have. Correct. And can a can one harvester hold both permits? No. Um, this past year, with the um, arrival of this new firm, and in past years due to changing dynamics in the fishery, we've allowed people to turn over their permit once a season, mm -hmm. and put so a bait harvester could become a biomedical harvester. They just have to put their bait harvest permit as a as a off take their bait harvest permit off their permit. Um, for the remainder of the calendar year to move into the biomedical fishery. Um, and in order to get a bio, so whereas the bait fishery permit is limited entry, we don't live an entry into the biomedical harvest fishery. What we do is require that that entity has a working relationship with a biomedical firm or a dealer working as that firm's proxy. We just don't want anyone getting these permits and then looking to sell biomedical crabs. We want those harvesters working for the firms that are going to be bleeding the crabs. And I was just thinking it'd be interesting to see those numbers because I'd like to know how many harvesters are participating in, you know, both sides of this, the biomedical and the hand harvest, uh, the um, bait. I, I don't know if I couldn't find it, but maybe I... Yeah, I, I, it wasn't included in the memo, but we could certainly put that together for public hearing. That's not a difficult figure for us to, to pull. And then I was just a follow-up question to that. So from those um, harvester numbers, is we're able to understand the level of horseshoe crabs harvested for bait and biomedical purposes, right? Could, could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Sorry, I just was wondering, the, the harvesters also have to report how much they're harvesting as well, whether it's for the biomedical purposes or the bait, is that correct? Um, on the, I believe so, yes. On the bait side, they have to report on a trip level basis on their monthly catch reports. I believe it's the same thing on the biomedical side, but I'd ask Story or Derek to confirm that for me. Yep, yeah, that's right. Yep. So I just was curious, like, it seems like we're able to get the same kind of data that would have not been released because we only had less than three dealers previously. Um, we could get a similar type of data to the what's being harvested, both from, maybe I'm totally wrong, but from the, for the so biomedical. It needs to be, it needs to be both. The, the, the rule of three need, applies to uh, both. So if there's only... You know, if there's 500 harvesters, but there's only two dealers buying it, that data is still confidential. Gotcha. So, That's interesting. Yeah. And then I just was had one more follow-up question. Sorry, there's a lot here. And um, uh, I was just curious, you know, if there is, um, if there is some die off from harvesting, if a trawler is harvesting for biomedical purposes and some crabs get crushed or whatever, um, instead of just tossing that back as waste and not being able to use it, you know, count it towards the bait fishery death and have that used for bait, it would be interesting to find if there's a way to recapture whatever um, mortality happens in on that kind of trip. And I, I know that's probably complicated, but I just was curious. I, I was... had the same thought, Shelly, and it, it is, but, you know, I think, you know, Optimal mutilization is something that we need to, to to try to achieve here. So it is worth looking into, but it, as you pointed out, it is also complicated. Yeah. Yeah, yeah Shelly, I would react to that and say, um, you make a good point. Up until now, we really haven't had a need to do that because 
uh, a lot of the um, biomedical harvest was predominantly um, hand harvest. And I'm guessing that the hand harvest uh, uh, techniques are more benign than auto trawling. And mm -hmm. it's only been in the last year where we've seen more, more directed auto trawling, specifically for biomedical. Um, we all recognize there's been biomedical uh, um, bleeding of bait harvested crabs, the so-called rent-a-crab program. But any dead crabs, uh, obviously, uh, in that situation, were counted against the bait quota. We're entering a new realm. And so you bring up a good point that we should probably be thinking about going forward. Thanks. Those are all my questions. Appreciate it all. Thank you, Shelley. Thank you, Shelley. Jared. Lou Williams. Lou Williams, you're recognized. Uh, yeah, I just had one question on it. Correct me if I'm wrong. It, it sounded like the uh, hand harvesters did their did most of their stuff in May and June, and I was curious at what the uh, elimination of May to the hand harvesters, what percentage of their normal take. <clears throat> Even though you get a hundred more crabs in June, I, you know, it seems like they kind of started this biomedical thing in it. I, I, you know, sometimes I just see like the low hanging fruit. All of a sudden, yeah, you're, 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 you're the one that takes the biggest hit. You know, so. Sure. Um, so my understanding, Lou, is May is the predominant spawning month. So that's the month that these are most available to hand harvesters because they're hand they're harvesting them off the spawning beaches. Uh, Derek, can you speak to the exact proportions of May compared to April, June? So speaking to May specifically, as far as the breakdown of who's landing what. It's usually about 99% harvested by hand and about 1% by mobile gear. So that one month is very skewed towards hand harvest. The rest of the year is pretty skewed towards dragger fleet. Um, there's about 50-50 split in June, but outside of that, it's basically all mobile gear. And do you have numbers on what proportion of the hand harvest occurs in May as opposed to the remaining months? I, More don't, than 50%? Have, I don't have it in front of me. But as far as when it occurs, it's it's going to be the vast majority is going to be in May yeah. and some in June. Yeah, Lou, so your gut there is right. It would be a substantial loss of access in yeah. May. Yeah, and that was, you know, to me, that was a concern. You know, it sounded like these guys started the biomedical thing with the way they harvest. And now it seems like uh, they could possibly uh, just lose that, that, you know, a big percentage of that fishery, you know, for um, um and I just, I just hate to see that happen. That's all. That's my concern. Appreciate the comment, Lou. Okay. Aaron? I'm not seeing any other comments, Mr. Chair. If we want to move on to Menhaden. Uh, I, as chair, I'd like to make a couple of comments as far as the observer program is concerned for all those listening in to this business meeting. It's going to take uh, <clears throat> revenues, you know, coming to DMF from the Hill. So everybody concerned about the horseshoe crab should be getting in touch with legislatures to make sure that DMF is funded for an observer program. Also in this being how this is a, this fishery exploded in the past year, uh, we tripled our landings. And when I hear about observer programs, yes, you put a physical observer on the vessel, but I think in this plan, uh, what are we going to do? Go on the honor system when it comes to medical harvesters? Like I heard uh, Mr. Perry speak that horseshoe crabs that die before they're bled have to be accounted for. So I think we need an open, transparent uh, book of regulations for this fishery. That's number one when it comes to the observer program. It can, can not only be on the vessels. But we need an honest, transparent way of going about business with the biomedical that, you know, it's not the honor system that they're called up and they have to give vital reports. Uh, we all know that the bait industry, that's a terminal number. Those crabs are harvested. We know that dead is dead and they're going to be used for bait. So I think it's important when we talk about an observer program that we look at all facets, not only on the vessel itself. 
Number two, Jared, I'm a little confused on conservation. B, establish an annual process a quota of 200,000. I believe I heard today you had uh, in 22, the confidentiality rule does not hold because you had three biomedical buyers. So in the future, it might go back to two, but I also heard the number of 173,000 horseshoe crabs, not 200,000. So I was wondering how we came up with a number of 200,000 when you had three competitors in the biomedical industry harvesting horseshoe crabs. Yeah, uh, why, didn't we, why didn't we just think of a number of 175,000? So to, to answer your question, or to, to, to make one statement and answer your questions, I, I'm not sure it's correct to say landings triple this year. We haven't released over landings data compared to prior years on an overall basis because prior years are, um, are um, confidential. What, what we have said is that, that, that landings have increased substantially in 2022 from the biomedical fishery compa compared to prior years. Uh, that said, um, you know, overall mortality um, this past year is in line with where it has been in past year, in, in prior years. You know, it, it's, 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 in, it's not totally out of whack with past years. Um, now, in terms of the 200,000 crab limit, um, one of the firms, the, the new firm in town, um, they really didn't get going until... Um, you know, the middle of the summer this past year. Um, and had they been involved in the fishery in the months prior to that, there would have been some additional uh, biomedical harvest. Um, and we were looking to accommodate um, some growth there, considering, considering um, how that played out last year and how we would expect it to play out in the future. Um, so that's where that comes from, it is it's not a it's not an exact approximation of where we were um, this past year, but rather a, you know, a using last year as a guideline for where we might be going in the future. And Ray, the 25,000 crab cut, we hope accommodates, um, the 25,000 crab cut from the bait quota, we think would accommodate the 200,000 quota for the biomedical harvesters. Thank you. In terms of anticipated mortality. All right, Mr. Chair, would you like to proceed to Manhattan? Yes, by all means, if there's no other questions on this subject matter, we'll move on to commercial Manhattan management. All right. Dick. Uh, this is me. Yes. Good morning, everyone. It's Nicola. Um, so um, here we also have a pretty extensive proposal for Menhaden. Um, most of this or a lot of it responds to the changes to the interstate plan that occurred um, for this year. Um, two major changes were um, reallocation of the, the state by state quotas um, with an increase for Massachusetts. Um, along with that re reallocation, you know, we, we expect that um, transfers of unused quota will um, decrease. There'll be less quota available for that. Um, so the, the consequence of that is, um, you know, that we're kind of starting the year with a 10.8 million pound quota and an expectation um, that it'll probably stay similar to that level unless there are extenuating circumstances. Whereas in, in prior years, we started with a quota of about half that amount and then we're very active in the in getting quota transfers to extend our, our season and our, and our access to um, the fish off our waters or in our waters. Um, the other change to the interstate plan was uh, removing per sains as an allowable gear um, in the small scale non-directed um, fishery that occurs after a state takes its quota. So the interstate plan has had a 6,000 pound limit um, available for use after a state takes its quota. 
and um, pretty much all gears were allowed to operate under that, including per sans, and um, that that one gear was removed from that category of small scale directed gear. So, with those two changes, um, we were looking to reevaluate our quota management system, and um, work towards several goals of um, continuing to provide a, a long season of access to manage um, the supply of Menhaden to both the, the frozen and the fresh markets um, and continue to recognize um, the diversity that exists in this fleet and the historical users um, upon which our, our quota uh, was initially based. So, um, uh, and then we also address um, some other issues, um, you know, uh, that I'll get into in more detail, but things like moving permit conditions into regulations similar to what you saw um, in the horseshoe crab proposal. So starting off the, the first one here um, adopts those um, gear categories, um, whereby per sands are no longer considered a small scale directed gear that is an, an uh, interstate management plan requirement. Um, the second um, issue looks at moving the start of the fishery from June 1st to June 15th. Um, this is um, working towards that goal of extending the season length. Um, this is something I should mention that we had two scoping meetings um, already, one in September and one in January um, that were really well attended and the input provided by the fleet um, uh, is reflected in a number of these proposals. Um, and that June 15th start date was um, pretty well received from large scale and smaller scale harvesters as a, as a tool to to you know, shift landings to align with um, bait uh, demand. Um, and so prior to that June 15th season, there would be a 6,000 pound limit for those newly defined small scale and non-directed gears. Um, we have um, in the past and would maintain an exemption for the weir fishery, which is um, you know, non-directed, um, kind of opportunistic when it comes to Menhaden. And if the fish arrive, um, we've provided access at that larger trip limit to avoid um, unnecessary discarding. Um, the third issue looks at revising our quota use triggers and trip limits. Um, and a small tweak to the first part of it. Right now we're at 125,000 pounds. Um, this would change to 120,000 pounds to better align with um, three truck loads. Um, and that 50% quota use trigger is down from what is currently an 85%. Um, and that would provide in you know, a similar amount of pounds to that size of the fishery. Um, we would then move to 25,000 pounds. Um, until 85% of the quota, and then use the last 15% of the quota at 6,000 um, pounds. And that last part you know, responds to the fact that per sains can't operate after the quota is um, achieved. And so it, it's kind of moving that part of the fishery into the, into the quota. Um, and we anticipate that landings after the quota is taken would be um, very minor under the, the gears that would be authorized at that point. Um, we are proposing to um, prohibit per se an activity on Fridays during the first 50% of the quota um, as both a tool to extend the fishery um, and to um, mitigate uh, some user group conflict on a, a popular um, sport fishing day. Um, we anticipate that that 50% of the quota use would really just be for a couple months in June. Um, so Friday would continue to be an open personating day uh, for most of the season, July and August, um, in response to some um, industry feedback that, that Friday is an important day um, for you know, local um, direct to harvest sales during, during the season. Um, then number five um, is that FMP requirement to take persons out of the, the small scale fishery after the quota is taken. Um, we're also looking at changing the trip limit for the episodic event set aside fishery were we to opt into it to 6,000 um, pounds. The FMP maximum is a 120,000 pound trip limit, um, but we have not 
uh, allowed access at that point. We've used permit conditions in the past to set the trip limit at 25,000 pounds for limited entry users so that the fishery continued at the same level as it was before. Um, and so this would continue to do that, have a 6,000 pound trip limit, which is where the fishery would have been at for the last 15% of the quota. Moving on to the next slide, um, we are proposing to um, not, not allow the use of carrier vessels once the trip limit gets down to 6,000 pounds to continue to allow them at those larger trip limits. Um, reflecting current practices, but be clear that once the fishery gets to 6,000 pounds, we're in that last 15% of quota. We're going we're gonna to try at that point to maintain, um, you know, a longer season and not allow carriers at that time. Uh, number eight and nine look at some new um, proposals for um, the the vessel and the gear. Um, the first number eight would be to. Um, is, is similar to something that is a requirement in Rhode Island where um, fish holds have to be um, surveyed by a accredited marine surveyor and their, their capacity certified and, and marked at levels that would aid in enforcement and compliance. This is something that um, environmental police have um, mentioned um, to us for a number of years as something that would really help in the enforcement of trip limits. Um, and number nine would be to have on an annual basis, um, have the nets per se nets that have a, um, a length or depth uh, restriction on them to have those um, uh, checked by DMF staff um, prior to the start of the fishing year, uh, the nets would be tagged. Um, and then any alteration of, of the nets after that point would require the, the nets to be recertified. Um, and so this is uh, also similar to something that's done in Rhode Island. Um, and one thing that we've discussed is that if, you know, your nets are tagged in Rhode Island and we, it's the same size restriction, then you wouldn't have to potentially do that again um, in Massachusetts. Um, but that would also, this is also intended for as a, you know, a law enforcement and compliance improvement. The next several um, numbers here, um, starting with 10 and going on to the next slide, are all things that adopt what we have in permit conditions into the regulations. Um, and so that we issue pretty extensive permit conditions currently for the per se fishery and access to the inshore restricted waters. So a lot of what you're seeing here um, is just putting those into the, into the regulations um, for the similar rules that Jared discussed about, um, you know, the transparency of the regulations, uh, the clarity and the applicability of the rules, and then any changes to these, once they're in the regulations, any changes, um, you know, it requires that we have public comment and that the, that the commission um, be afforded the, the opportunity to, to vote on those proposals as well. So the first set here looks at um, putting per se conditions into the regulations, including closed days, night closure, um, certain area closures. Um, moving on to the next slide, um, we would uh, the perm there's also per permit conditions for the inshore restricted waters that set the the net um, maximum at 600 feet. So that would go into the regulations. One action here, um, 11B responds to an industry request to lift some, some hand haul requirements in several of the inshore restricted waters in, in Boston Harbor. Um, and so we're gonna take public comment on that. And then a part 12, um, these are some permit conditions that were on carrier vessels that would go into the regulations. Um, notably, uh, there is a prohibition on and carry vessels in Boston Harbor that's in the permit conditions that we would adopt. And we also have set rules in recent years or permit conditions about um, you know, carrier vessels only, be able, only being able to heart, um, accept fish from, from one vessel once a day, um, you know, only on open days, um, all that could go into the regulations. Um, part 13 also responds to an industry request that was heard at the scoping meetings. There's been an um, increase of interest in, in the Menhaden fishery. Um, we expect that to maintain, and so um, industry participants were interested in us adopting a control date for um, the limited entry Menhaden permit endorsements, as well as the open access cap per se permit. 
Um, so uh, with as with other control dates, um, getting the control date into the regulations is, is the first step. And then any potential restrictions on access using that control date would be part of a, a supplemental regulatory process. Um, and lastly, 14 um, would be to um, add a requirement for daily electronic reporting for the limited access permit holders um, beginning next year. Um, Jared spoke to this uh, with Horseshoe Crab about, you know, the, the need for additional accountability uh, and daily um, from harvesters. And that would be a good tool for us to apply in the in the Menhaden fishery as well as a stepping stone to more widespread application of this type of requirement. Uh, so that that's that is the the extent of our proposal. Um, so if there are any questions, questions from commission members for Ms. Missouri. Leo. Leo, you recognize. Leo. Yeah, is Thank you, Chairman. I, my, my fingers weren't working properly. Thank you. Uh, Nicola, 12C, year-round prohibition, Boston Harbor. Um, what is the reason for that? Uh, that that's a relatively how, well, I'm not sure if I always call it longstanding, but for three or four years at least, we've um, prohibited carrier vessels in Boston Harbor as a um, kind of a user conflict uh, rule. So that the, the, the seining activity um, happens at, at smaller limits there without carrier vessels. Okay, thank you. Aaron? Lou? Lou, you're recognized. Uh, yeah, I just had a question on the um, the percentages when, when you go to the fifth, at the end of this season, the 15%, that at 6,000, that's, um, uh, I just took 10 million roughly and 15% um, um, of that, 1.5 million, it would be about 250 trips. Um, well, it's starting the season later. We know we'll be in later in the season um, when the fish will be leaving. The number of participants, is, is there a possibility we're even going to um, be able to get that kind of trips? Or, uh, you know, like I said, I just don't want to see stuff left on the table at the end of the year if, if, if the smaller folks that will participate in 6,000 will be able to do that many trips. Thanks. So our, um, you know, our, our projections uh, put us out to early September for this combination of rules with the, the June 15th start date and, and this set of trip limits. Um, we have a pretty good handle on the rate of landings at 120,000 pounds and 25,000 pounds. We did our, our best kind of guess at the 6,000 pound limit, how long that would last. Um, but going into mid or early September, we've we've you know definitely seen the fishery continue later than that. Um, but um, the there does also exist the the rule that allows the director to um, change trip limits in order to um, make use of available quota. So um, I, that is a tool that could be used if we are are off with our projections here. Okay, good. Thanks. Or alternatively, Lou, if you think that number 85 should be higher, you know, that's the kind of thing that we can discuss as a final action, you know, once you see what yeah. Nicola's projections. So yeah. those are the things that we could we, we could work on uh, after the hearing and be, and as we make recommendations to you. Yeah, that's yeah, that's that was just my it seemed like a lot of trips for the end of the season. And we really don't know how right. abundant the fish will be, you know, too, you know, so Understood. that's all. Yeah. OK. Thank you. Questions for Nicola? That's all I'm saying from the commission, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Nicola, for your presentation. We will move on now, accommodating federal maximum retention and electronic monitoring program. Yeah, Ray, this is the second time this has come up um, for us uh, as a public hearing item. We didn't adopt it the last time uh, because it was a delayed federal rule and because uh, under the, our administrative procedures um, guidelines, we have to bring it out a second time because we didn't enact it. But Jared, um, I, I think you can probably cover this uh, pretty quickly. Yeah, 
Um, this is based pilot program started in 2018, Gulf of Maine Research Institute, no one, New England states, to um, incentivize electronic monitoring in the sector ground in the federal sector ground fish fleet to study challenges and inform future policy. And the incentive there was for maximum retention of species, meaning you know retention of sublegal size species was mandatory. Um, for several years, I think four years, it was a four or five years, it was accommodated by a um, federal EFP complemented by a state LOA. For 2023, NOAA Fisheries has adopted this as a formal allowance within the multi species FMP as part of Amendment 23. What we're trying to do now is just match that allowance to allow federal sector vessels participating in the MRM program and federal ground fish dealers um, purchasing from those vessels to be exempt from our ground fish minimum size standards in accordance with the federal rules. Um, so that this is merely an action to accommodate what they're authorized to do under the federal MRM program that we're currently accommodating by an LOA. So rather than have to annually issue these LOAs, we're just going to adopt a regulation. This isn't going to affect the minimum size standards for sector vessels not participating in the MRM program, um, common pool vessels or state waters only vessels, nor is it going to mandate uh, you know, electronic monitoring um, for any ground fish participants that aren't voluntarily doing this as part of the federal MRM program. Questions for Jared. Lou, is your hand up for Menhaden, and did you have a question on this as well? Sorry, I forgot to bring my hand down. <laughs> no questions here then, Mr. Chair. And we can move along on the agenda. I'm calling for a 10 minute break. Resume at 1027, Chair yes, McCain. Sir. All right. Yes, Thank you. 10 minutes. And is raised. We're good to go, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jared. Is Suki's hand raised, Jared? Yes. I see a chat there, Ray, from him. He, he, he doesn't think his audio is working. He's not going to be checked. Yeah, I'm still not getting your audio, Suki, if you're speaking. All right, Mr. Chair, Sugi's audio is still not working. If you want to proceed to the agenda. Thank you very much, Jared. Moving on, discussion items, interstate fisheries management update. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Uh, Nicola's going to take this. Um, hey, Ray, just as a as a process uh, uh, question, if Sugi continues to have no audio, could he relay um, questions uh, like through, say, Jared? By, all by, means. by phone. Okay. Why don't we why don't we try to do that? Yeah, Jared? But let, let his questions be word for word. You know, we don't want to lose anything in translation. Yeah. Well sure. The easiest way to do that is probably through the chat function. That way it becomes a public record as well. Okay. Thank you, Jared. All right. Um Nicola's gonna start with a summary of the uh ASMFC uh issues. We had a meeting that was held. Um Two weeks ago, down at uh, in DC, and it was pretty successful. Great to see people again. And Nicola has a, a good summary of uh, what transpired at the meeting. All right. Good morning again. Um, so I'll 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 hit on those uh, winter meeting updates from the ASMC as well as talk about um, 
uh, where we are with the process for setting the, the recreational scup and black sea bass measures for this year. Um, so the first item was the lobster board meeting. Um, want you wanted to let you know that we have a hearing um, coming up for draft addendum 27 for lobster. Um, it's going to be on March 15th. Um, the ASMC is, is lining up all those hearing dates and we'll put an announcement out with them soon and then we'll be sure to spread that word as well. But um, draft addendum 27 addresses um, some additional protection for the Gulf of Maine and George's Bank spawning stock biomass. Um, there's two sets of measures, um, some that would look at some immediate standardizing of measures across the LMAs to the most conservative. So there are some notable um, implications for uh, the Outer Cape Cod, where you in this table, you see the difference between state waters and federal waters or permit holders, and um, it would apply the, the more conservative measure um, across the LMA, regardless of um, you know, permit permitting. Um, and the other set of measures would um, either establish a, a set schedule across a number of years or have some um, index based triggering um, the, based on the recruitment indices that would lead to um, uh, minimum gauge size increases in LMA1 and uh, maximum gauge size decreases in LMA3 and the Outer Cape Cod. Um, so look for that um, public hearing notice um, to be involved in that process moving forward. Um, uh, moving on to the next slide, um, Winter Flounder was a board meeting where new stock assessments for the uh, both the Gulf of Maine and the Southern New England stock were reported out to the board. Um, both of these stocks are considered to be in, in a depleted status. Um, one change was um, to the Southern New England Mid-Atlantic stock is no longer considered overfished um, because the reference points um, were changed um, and lowered based on using a truncated recruitment series that you know, reflects the the sense that this stock uh, cannot recover to, to prior levels due to um, changes in the environment. Um, so the the Mid Atlantic Council, uh, sorry, the New England Council had set the state water subcomponents um, for the for the stocks, and at this ASMC meeting, the board's uh, task was to consider whether or not to make any changes to the um, the state waters measures and um, based on the stock status and. Um, you know, the, the state water subcomponents that were met, they did not make any changes to the measures. These have been in place since 2014. So no action will be required on our part to change the winter founder regulations as um, response to the stock assessments. Uh, next slide, um, one of the uh, Board meetings that there were there was a lot of interest in to see an outcome um, was striped bass. Um, there was an expectation that there was going to be final action on the draft addendum, um, which considered uh, allowing transfers of the coastal commercial quota between states on a voluntary basis. Um, the public comment uh, we had a including a hearing in Massachusetts. Um, there was there was a lot of concern about allowing these transfers to occur um, at this time, given the overfish nature of the stock, and that this would be activating latent quota and lead to an increase in F. Um, so the board, instead of taking action this meeting, decided to request some projections from the technical committee as to um, what would actually happen to fishing mortality and the rebuilding timeline if all the commercial quota was utilized. Um, so we expect to get those results at the next board meeting. Um, but also to look at um, the 2022 removals and the early signs from the MRIP data is that the recreational harvest has increased in, in 2022 above the levels in, in 2020 and 2021 um, where overfishing ended um, as a consequence of the new management measures. So the board will be deal dealing with both of those, this new information when they take final action on the addendum in May. Um, for American Eel, I wanted to mention that there was a new benchmark stock assessment completed there. Um, it continues to be a difficult stock to assess, um, but there was some um, 
suggestion that the the cap that exists for yellow eel harvest is is too high and that it may need to be reduced. Um, However, the, the peer review panel for this benchmark assessment um, had some concerns about utilizing this method right away. And so it's going to go back to the stock assessment subcommittee to address some of those peer review concerns. Um, but I, I mentioned this because there is a potential that in the future, we, we may have a yellow eel quote, a state, a state by state yellow eel quotas, um, which would um, require us to think about the management in Massachusetts of, the, of our very limited yellow eel fishery. Um, next is spiny dogfish um, uh, in a very, what was an expected action. Um, the, the coastwide quota was set uh, at 12 million pounds consistent with action out of both councils. This is a, a large reduction in, in the coastwide quota um, down to what the landings have been in recent years. Um, part of the, the backdrop to that decision, though, was that there were some early implications from the, the research track assessment that um, was ongoing at the time um, that, you know, suggests that um, productivity of the stock has been overestimated and that, um, you know, the, the quotas of 20 million pounds or landings of that level um, were causing overfishing to happen in prior years. So, um, that research track assessment um, is still kind of the first step in having an assessment that's going to be used for management purposes and setting, setting of the quotas, but the next step will be a management track assessment um, with data through last year that will be used for dogfish management in the future, but the early in indications are, are that the, the commercial quotas are unlikely to be at the, the higher levels that they were in prior years. Um, and the, the northern region trip limit was also set at 7,500 uh, pounds. Um, that applies to Maine through Connecticut. Um, so we don't need to make a change there um, either. Um, one other uh, research track assessment that I, um, these weren't reviewed at the, at the ASMSC winter meeting, but they were presented to both councils in recent weeks, and these are ASMSC managed species as well. So um, on the bluefish, bluefish research track assessment, um, there's also a new model being used there, and it, it suggests that um, we have um, ended overfishing on bluefish and that the stock is not overfished. Um, so after the management track assessment is, is completed this year, um, we'll see what implications this has for um, the rebuilding plan for bluefish, as it was previously determined to be overfished and um, had some reference points that were at levels previously unseen in the fishery and this this research track assessment and as bringing those reference points back down into something that you know is more likely achievable. Um, so moving on to um, the next slide um, and where we are with SCUP and black sea bass measures for this year. Um, I've previously reported to the commission how um, we find ourselves in this 10% reduction box for recreational scup and sea bass this year. Um, that was something that we knew um, back in December over the last um, month and a half and still ongoing at this point to some degree the, the states have been working on developing proposals to um, achieve these 10% mandatory reductions. Um, there's going to be an ASMSC virtual only board meeting on March 2nd to approve that range of proposals. So after that, we're anticipating um, in mid-March that we'll have a scoping meeting in Massachusetts to review the options and that would and tr and then um, be able to bring to you on March 25th, 21st at your meeting, um, our preferred approach for meeting these reductions. Um, and to, to get your buy-in, it is we are going to have to go through the emergency rulemaking process. So it wouldn't be until later in the summer where we're actually looking for your your vote and endorsement of the final rules. But we'd like to get your your support for our preferred approach um, at that March 21st meeting, um, and then after that, we anticipate we'd be able to announce announce the rules, um, which. Uh, you know, for higher businesses in particular um, are interested to know when those seasons are going to start. So um, the next slide looks a little bit at where we are with SCUP. Um, as you know, uh, Dan, do you want to jump in? 
you have your hand up? No, I'll, I'll wait till you finish. Oh, your presentation. Okay. All right. Um, so with, with SCUP, um, for both species, we're in a region. Uh, it's a regional management approach for, for Massachusetts through New York. Um, with SCUP, the measures within the region are, are nearly uniform with the exception of when we have the for hire bonus season. Um, so we're working as a region to try to maintain very similar regulations and achieve this 10% reduction together. Um, and we knew going into it that um, in order to achieve a 10% reduction through the bag limit, it would be a very um, dramatic change. Um, there was an analysis done for the council meeting that showed that a 15 fish bag limit coastwide would only achieve a 5% reduction. So we went into this as a region not thinking that bag limit changes were going to be our preferred approach. Um, we also know that the, the importance of the of seasons are different within our region. Um, the states to our south um, put more importance on November and December than we obviously do. Um, May is more important to us. So seasonal closures um, would have some different effects. And so um, we we're hoping to, to minimize that. Um, we, we have in the last several years had January through April open, and um, this has, uh, we think, not led to a great deal of increase in harvest, but we have gotten some pretty unrealistic MRIP estimates from that time period being open. Um, and as that was one of the more recent liberalizations that occurred, it, we thought it made sense to um, kind of back that up as part of this, this um, proposal. Um, and we did know that increasing the size limit by just a half an inch could achieve the 10% reduction, but there was concern through each of our states about increasing the size limits for shore access. Um, and then the council also had recommended that the federal rules change to make that January through April time period closed. Um, that wouldn't come into effect until 2024, though, um, and that the, the bag limit on the coast be reduced to 40 fish as a maximum. So on the next slide, you'll see that what the northern region has been um, working on and is developing as kind of a, a single option at this point um, is to Increase use that use the, the benefit of the size limit increase to get our reduction and apply it to all the modes except for shore fishing um, and put a um, instead a nine and a half inch size limit on shore fishing and a ten and a half for the other modes um, and also close January through April and reduce the for hire bonus season to forty fish. Um, this here as a region gets us very, very, very close to that 10% reduction. Um, we may need to look at tweaking the season date a little bit on the tail end um, or, or the bag limits a little bit to get just past that 10%, um, but that's still something that we're working on right now to fine tune this proposal. So uh, I expect that you know, we, we may be kind of limited to this one option for SCUP um, because we are doing it as a region, um, but there, there may there may be maybe two sub options or something that look at do we get some extra reduction through the season or the bag limit, um, but I don't expect that there's going to be a, you know, a really big range of options here for SCUP. Um, moving on to sea bass. Um, in this case, while we are a region um, of mass through New York, our, our measures are very different. Um, states have, over the years, um, worked individually to achieve reductions when we've ne needed to and put different priority on season length or bag limit. And so the rules are different and it's, um, it's a pretty much impossible to get us all back together uh, currently um, when we're looking at a 10% reduction. So each state is kind of going it alone to figure out how to um, reduce harvest by 10% for next year. Um, looking at Massachusetts in particular, our season is already relatively restricted and um, achieving a 10% reduction by season um, would mean cutting out all of May um, or ending in early August if we were just taking off from the front the back end and those were options that we didn't think would be well received. Um, we saw that a half inch size increase or reducing the bag limit to three fish uniformly would achieve that reduction. Um, however, in, in consideration of, of the small, you know, overall contribution um, to, from the for hire fishery and yet the implications for their businesses, we have put together a couple options that would exempt the for hire fishery from the reduction. 
Um, and in particular, we're also looking at some that would um, reduce the private and shore bag limit um, in order to provide for a longer season there, which could have a couple benefits of, of providing us with some information in September and October where the fishery has been closed. And we, we think that there, you know, could be declining effort and a reduction in catch and that we should be able to get a longer season if we just had the data to prove that our rates fall off then we've been kind of in this catch 22 situation. Um, but that so that's what we're looking at um, and and cutting the bags also would reduce some pressure on um, spawning harvest in, in May and June on spawning fish so the next slide kind of breaks it down into six options that we've developed. Um, uh, and so we, we focus a couple of them on, or one of them on just changing the minimum size, and then the rest of them are, are looking at different bags, um, including some mode splits. Um, the dates are still being worked out on to just kind of fine tune the percent reduction. Um, the, these estimates or these um, options are being run through a model. And so you get a result and you say, you put in something and it says, oh, that's a 12% reduction. Okay, well, we only need a 10% reduction. So we, we're still going through the process of kind of fine tuning it to see what the seasons are. But at this point, I know that option one would be um, May 20th to September 7th as that fine tuned date. But the other options here have to be tweaked a little bit more still. But I expect by the time we get to um, a scoping meeting, Meeting in mid March, we'll have all, all the answers to you know what exactly what those seasons could be um, under these this different set of options. Uh, so that that's it for now. Unless there's questions. Thank you very much for your presentation, Nicola. Questions for Nicola from the commission members. Ray, I just want to make a comment to the commission and just uh, go, go over sort of uh, process a little bit. So. This is a unique suite of species that every year we have to um, go through this gymnastics of uh, compiling last year's MRIP data, uh, feeding it into the models uh, over the winter, Nicola and, and her, her counterpart uh, at, at uh, uh, not Greg DeSalle's, um, Sam Truesdell analyzes these data. And so, uh, we are not able to go through the normal uh, procedures where we can have a public hearing and come back to you with final rules that we get enacted. In this case, as we mentioned before, um, we have to come to you with a proposed emergency action. So we're, we want you to uh, weigh in on these rules that I will be enacting as emergencies um, normally, an emergency action is one where I don't need the commission, the commission's a, approval, and then we come to you to try to figure out if we can make this final. But we we really need to make it final. So consensus among the commission members at the April meeting is is what we'll we'll expect to get from you folks. So your input's really important, um, even though it's going to be an emergency action by by the director, by me, um, we don't want that to change into any final, final rule. So um, that's that's why we're in the situation we are. And for these, this just for this suite of species, we've got this really obnoxious process every spring. Yeah, Dan, if I can add lib to that, I because it is such a troublesome fishery in the sense of management, even being regionalized. I've often wondered, and I've said it before, and I'll say it again, why we cannot change the year, the fishing year on black sea bass so that we're getting six wave information in November or December, as opposed, I don't think six wave information has been released yet. And that's why we as a state, are always going to emergency actions. I don't know why at ASMFC, they will not recognize the issues that our state goes through year in and year out, specifically to black sea bass. Yeah, fair point, Ray. Uh, Jared's just reminded me that we wanna take a final action on this at our late March meeting in order to get the rules in place. It wouldn't be the April meeting. Thank you. Bill Amaru. 
Bill, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Nicola, can we go back to kind of the beginning and work from there forward for my comments? Um, let's start with the lobster. Yep. So I see that in the outer Cape zone, we're going to be joining the uh, maximum size limit uh, and previously had none. Is that correct? That, that is one of the options in the document, yes. One of the options in document, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I want the, the, the members of the commission to understand something about the Outer Cape area that, that may not be familiar with the lobster, and so you certainly would know, and I'm sure others do as well, but the Outer Cape lobster management area, as Phil could probably help us with if he was able to join the conversation, uh, took place with the input of a number of active lobstermen from the Outer Cape area, and it was able to be uh, implemented because it was well presented and had evidence of success, which we know is the past 20 odd years have, have been very successful for our region. But with the uh, changes that are coming up, I know I've spoken to a number of lobstermen and seen the number of permits transferred from uh, people that are leaving the industry. We've lost about 15% so far on the outer Cape that I know of who are leaving they're leaving, period. They're leaving not just the fishery, they're leaving the state because of difficulties of raising a family and finding finding uh, housing on the Cape with the changes in our demographics. Uh, so these are these are significant changes that are going to alter the way fishing is done on the backside of Cape Cod for lobsters. That's that's the first thing. The other thing, you can go to dogfish. Uh, we're, we're remaining at a 7,500 pound trip limit, Nicola. That, that's correct. Um, because, because a, a decision it, was previously made that additional changes to the trip limit would not be considered until after the um, stock assessments have been concluded. Right. And I'm not surprised to hear that there's been less um, uh, uh, dogfish in the uh, assessment estimations. Uh, it's not so much because I think there's fewer of them, but I, I know that the changes in their habits uh, are going on with water temperatures and bait movements, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I think the stock is extremely large, much, much larger than historical uh, numbers could indicate. We had them that go back into those dates. I know on the Cape, we had a, about a one month period, May, part of May, part of June, where the dogfish were moving through the, the intermediate waters heading into the beach where they would be spawning. And uh, we went jigging during that period of time because you couldn't set a trawl without catching the dogfish. And then again, on the way out in October, we'd have them for a couple of weeks and then they'd be gone. Now it's virtually the entire year that they're available throughout almost the entire fishery off the Cape. Dogfish represent the major part of the fishery that we still have in, in Chatham anyway, along with skates. Uh, but I do, I want the commission to understand something also about that, those two fisheries, that the prices of these fish have not changed since the late 1990s. They're still getting in the mid twenties for dogfish, anywhere from 45 to 55 cents for skate wins. If you think about the changes that have happened in our socioeconomic systems in this country since that period of time, it's amazing to me that anyone is still fishing with these being the fish that we can land in any kinds of numbers. Just, just unbelievable that the prices haven't reflected a little bit of an increase, but the guys are determined to stick with it and that's what they're doing, guys and gals. Um, the other fish, um, the, the amount of information that you supplied is just remarkable. And I, I don't know how the heck you can put it all together, keep it in your head. You must be on the verge of getting your own set of gills with your familiarity with the fisheries, but it's been very comprehensive as usual from our state people. And I thank you for the opportunity to make my comments. Jared? Mike Pierdenock? Michael, you recognize. Mike, you're muted. Michael, you're muted. Have you got him, Jared? No, he's still muted.
Well, let's move. Are there other hands? We'll come back to Mike once he figures out his. There are not. Questions for Nicola? Uh, let me just say that, it, Mike, if when you're later on, if you want to follow up with me directly about any questions, please, please feel free. Thank you, Nicola. Let's move along to federal fisheries management update. I presume Ms. Griffin will be presenting, Dan, or not? Yes. I'm here, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Just wait for Jared to pull up some slides. Thank you, Melanie. Well, while he's pulling them up, I hope everyone's uh, year is off to a good start. The council held its first meeting of the year in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, from January 24th to 26th. And I'm sure most of you know the big news coming out of that is that our longtime executive director, Tom Neese, is retiring this summer. And the search process for a new executive director is underway. Uh, you probably have seen an announcement that is looking to hire a search, um, an executive search firm to help with that. So the hope is to have a brief period of overlap between the outgoing and incoming ED. Um, and I can keep you updated on that process as we proceed. Then the other kind of non FMP specific update is that the council presented its Janice Plant Award of Excellence. And that was presented to retired industry member, Maggie Raymond, although she's not, <laughs> She hasn't been too retired, um, and that was in recognition of her longstanding contributions across numerous fisheries. So uh, in terms of FMP specific updates, next slide. I'll start with ground fish. And one of the main charges at our January meeting was to provide recreational management recommendations to GARFO for three stocks, Gulf of Maine cod, Gulf of Maine haddock, and Georgia's bank cod. And measures, as a reminder, are determined annually by the agency in consultation with the council. And the goal is, of course, to achieve but not exceed each stock sub ACL or target. Uh, and that's done mainly through adjustments to bag limits, minimum sizes, and seasons after a review of the recent catch and uh, comparing that to the upcoming uh, catch limits. Next slide. So as you can see here, recent catches for Gulf of Maine cod and haddock, if you look at the bold, uh, the recent catch, which is based on the average of the last three years show underutilization of both Gulf of Maine cod and haddock. That is that last um, column there. So you can see that Gulf of Maine cod, it was about 68% utilization. And for haddock, it was about 17% utilization. Next slide. So focusing on Gulf of Maine cod, the sub ACL is not changing, but as you can see in the table, the FY 2023 sub ACL for Gulf of Maine haddock is a major decline. And that reflects the aging out of that exceptional 2013 year class that we've talked about before. Uh, so the council was faced with needing to make some regulatory recommendations. Uh, we benefit in the Gulf of Maine from a bioeconomic model that does allow for projections of effort and catch levels to help us assess what potential measures might live up to um, the sub ACLs. And based on all that, the council has recommended, uh, actually next slide, Jared, has recommended eliminating the spring Gulf of Maine cod directed fishery. And that leaves the bag and minimum size at a status quo. So for cod, one one cod at 22 inches with that fall season from September to uh, the end of October. And then um, uh, the opposite uh, approach was basically taken to achieve the necessary 10% modality reduction for Gulf of Maine haddock, meaning the council has recommended lowering the bag limit and raising the minimum size while keeping the season the same as last year. So that's 15 fish at an 18 inch minimum size with the uh, split season there um, from May to the end of February and March is closed and then it reopens in April. And this is written like that because of the, the fishing year starting on, on May 1. Next slide. 
So Georgia's bank cod, there's a lot more uncertainty when it comes to that discussion and trying to come up with rulemaking. Uh, that's in part because there's no bioeconomic model and there is significant catch that has been coming from mid-Atlantic states, namely New Jersey and New York. So there needs to be coordinated state federal action, or we're hoping that there's coordinated state federal action. Overall, uh, the analysis appears that we need a 48% reduction in mortality. And based on the Science Center staff analysis, this is mainly uh, through Scott Steinbeck, this can be achieved if all states complement uh, what the council is newly recommending for measures. So that's a switch from the 22 to 28 inch slot limit to a 23 inch minimum size and to adjust the current fishery closure to later in the summer. So the fishery would open for the month of May then close until September. So we'll have to see how all that goes. Um, I will say, uh, sorry, the bag limit would remain at five fish. Um, in terms of coordination with the mid-Atlantic states at the council meeting, there were staff from New York and New Jersey that were on the webinar and they have indicated their willingness to consider state rulemaking. I know New Jersey has already had council staff down presenting on measures. So um, I will say I'm optimistic that we will end up in uh, a, a complementary place between state and federal rulemaking here. Uh, the only other groundfish uh, measures that I will mention from the January meeting is that we had to clean up a halibut recommendation uh, to finalize. There's no slide on this, Jared. Uh, a halibut recommendation in framework 65 because there was an error that was found in the assessment. So this uh, actually was beneficial. It bumped the ABC up from 149 metric tons to 160 metric tons. So the framework was uh, submitted, and we should see that being implemented by GARFO in time for the start of the fishing year on May 1. Next slide. So we'll move on to scallops. Uh, there wasn't anything in terms of specs at this meeting. We were focused on this northern Gulf of Maine control date. So the council had requested that NIMS, or the council is requesting that NIMS establish a control date that could be used to determine eligibility criteria for switching between the LAGC permit categories in the Northern Gulf of Maine. And if you look at that uh, flow chart in the bottom middle, that gives you a little indication of what can happen. There are three types of LAGC permit. Uh, category A is that IFQ. There's category B, which is the Northern Gulf of Maine permit, which is restricted just to fishing in the Northern Gulf of Maine. And then category C, which is incidental. And so there's some various um, movements between the permits that have been allowed. Uh, the IFQ can downgrade one time, uh, but there is annual switching that is allowed between the Northern Gulf of Maine and the incidental. Um, so in terms of the control date that the council is recommending, the exact date depends on when the federal register notice publishes. And as with all control dates, there are no built-in management measures. Those will need to be developed through the council process and its scallop committee. Uh, but I'll just note that the council did not prioritize doing that this year. So the next discussion on this really will be when the council takes up its annual prioritization process in September. I'll just note as a brief substantive summary, um, and this is where I, I added that table to the right, Basically, the concern here is about latent effort and the sustainable growth of the northern Gulf of Maine fishery. Um, so despite statements in the recently passed Gulf Amendment 21 about the path for growth, it does appear that folks are um, interested in inserting further constraints uh, or other measures. So if you look at this table that's summarizing the number of trips by uh, general category vessels, you'll see in the last line, 2022, and um, there's definitely been a growth in the number of active vessels, but at the same time, uh, you can see that the average number of trips also increased. So while you're seeing new entrants, uh, conceivably, uh, the previous participants were able to grow their fishery as well. So that, that one, we'll have to see how it gets taken up by the council uh, if and when it prioritizes measures. Next slide. So on to monkfish. This is a bit more of an involved discussion at the council. Uh, both the New England and MID at this point have approved the final specs package. They were in agreement. So that will move forward for implementation 
uh, by NIMP, but it really wasn't a simple task this year. And part of that was because the New England Council remanded the ABC recommendations, the OFL and ABC recommendations to the SSC, uh, expressing some displeasure about the ongoing use of the data poor assessment approach, which for this stock is called iSmooth. And without going into agonizing detail, I'm happy to follow up with folks uh, after the meeting. But just in summary, basically the revised ABC is an average of catch advice that is based on the old methodology of applying the survey index multiplier to recent three-year catches. Uh, and then the revised approach, which applies the multiplier to recent ABCs versus the three-year catches. So basically, this allows for a transition to lower catch advice, which you can see circled in red. And compared to 2021 landings, these represent um, a potential 2% increase in the Northern Fishery Management Area and a potential 76% increase in the Southern Fishery Management Area. But of course, there, there are some constraints that are going on with monkfish that don't have to do with regulations necessarily, market-based constraints. So the, the council approved the limits and then to support these catch limits, uh, they've, been, they've recommended days at sea allocations. That's the main effort control. But this year, the council is actually recommending separate days at sea allocations for the northern and southern areas. Currently, um, monkfish permit holders are allocated 46 days at sea which are reduced somewhat to support the monkfish RSA program. But for the next three fishing years, the council voted to make days at sea allocations, uh, again, distinct for each area. So 35 days in the Northern fishery management area and 37 in the Southern fishery management area. These are not additive. There is an overall cap um, when, it comes, when it comes to uh, the total number you can use. Uh, and that is 46. So that just prevents overall effort from increasing. Now, before I move off monkfish, uh, I just want to go back to the data poor approach and the ice smooth approach and some of the concerns that remain with that. Um, I mentioned the market influences on recent low catch and how that affects catch advice because, again, the ice smooth is basically taking a survey index multiplier and applying it to recent catch. So, uh, a lot of folks, there was discussion about that in particular, and then generally, you know, when a data poor approach is required, it's the intent to get out of that situation sooner than later and back to an analytical assessment. Of course, that's, you know, how you do that and how that's achievable is easier said than done. Um, but there is some frustration over the continued use of iSmooth with what seems to be perceived limited development towards, you know, an analytical solution. So for all those reasons, both the New England and mid councils have agreed to submit a letter asking that the Science Center, prior to the next management track assessment, um, you know, investigate the current ice smooth assumptions, um, ensure that the survey is tracking more than the survey noise, and that the recent catches and survey trends are linked, um, and also requesting uh, a, a detailed research plan to help increase the likelihood of the next research track uh, assessment being successful. And that's scheduled, that's not scheduled to 2027. So trying to improve the analytics behind monkfish. Next slide. Jared, next slide. Habitat, uh, there wasn't too much going on here. I mean, there's always updates and discussions on offshore wind, but what is um, under discussion by the council is the salmon aquaculture framework. Um, if you'll rec recall, this is about uh, trying to come through with an approach to authorize possession of aquaculture raised salmon in the EEZ that is currently, um, salmon's currently prohibited. So the, initially the approach is, has been to work through a framework. And while the outline of that action is taking shape through work of the Habitat PDT and committee, GARFO recently suggested an alternative approach that would just utilize letters of authorization. So the agency is looking into that approach and has said it will advise the Habitat committee at its next meeting. Um, meanwhile, the council decided in January that it will stand up an enforcement committee by the end of March to help inform the direction of any of these actions with regards to salmon aquaculture possession. So stay tuned on that and I'll, I'll keep you informed. Next slide. 
EBFM, uh, when the council fan finalized its 2023 management priorities in December, it somewhat, I don't want to quite say altered its course on EBFM, but it, it inserted a pause. Uh, basically, we've been, you know, trying to educate folks on what EBFM might look like and then have this prototype uh, management strategy evaluation before proceeding with any full-fledged MSC. So it, during prioritization, the council said, let's, let's pause before any full-fledged MSC. But since the December meeting, there seems to be, um, there was sufficient enough uncertainty about how to interpret what that meant for this year, that the council spent a lot of time at this past January meeting discussing how it would be proceeding in 2023. So if you recall in the, in the last quarter of 2022, basically October to December, the council had a, held a series of informational workshops on how EBFM can be used as a tool to assess and manage fisheries in general, and more specifically how that might actually be used to regulate fisheries on Georgia's bank. And at the end of the day, while the council is seeking additional engagement, from public and, and from fishermen through some more deep dive workshops, there's there's a real concern about the lack of tangible examples uh, on which industry can provide more concrete feedback and have more um, explicit understanding. There's uh, substantial confusion and seeming disinterest in the, the more theoretical discussion that has been happening to date. And, um, I think the council discussion and, and the, the folks that were in attendance in the public that were commenting, I think the council and EBFM chairs received some good feedback and they'll be utilizing that to help refine the EBFM work priorities this year. And I'll, again, I'll keep you posted as those discussions proceed. Next slide. So in terms of other updates, uh, within the region. A lot of this will, I'm sure, will be covered uh, by Bob and, and others in terms of protected species, but I'll just note um, in terms of the feedback from the council to GARFO, uh, with ropeless and mobile gear, there were nu numerous fishermen at the council meeting, and they did um, provide a, a number of concerns and feedback to the agency uh, Things like reliable cell service for app connection, concern about dummy marking, mandating a universal interface, um, noting that there are some lessons learned there from uh, implementation of electronic monitoring um, to get to a centralized platform and away from proprietary tech, which can often incur uh, costs when there's changes in providers or the technology itself. Um, I know Mike Pierdnock mentioned the need to engage recreational fishers in the floor hire industry in particular, uh, concerns about accuracy uh, via GPS, um, the, the kind of delays or upload in frequency and timelines. So that was just some of the feedback that the agency received in terms of engaging mobile gear with ropeless. And then um, in terms of sturgeon and gillnets, the council uh, basically talked in January about how it would proceed, and the intention here is to focus on monkfish and dogfish. That would be jointly managed, uh, sorry, that's jointly with the Mid-Atlantic, and then see if we can achieve the necessary reductions there without involving groundfish. So I think that's it in terms of my updates. Next slide. I think this is just the question slide. Yes. Okay. So that's it, Mr. Chair. Melanie, I, I think Mike Pierdenock is back in terms of his okay. audio, if you want to recognize him. Yep, whoever has any questions, Mr. Chair, happy to. Questions for Ms. Griffin, please. And by the way, Melanie, very thoughtful, comprehensive presentation. Thank you. Questions for Melanie. First up is Mike Pierdnock. Michael, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Melanie for the presentation. Uh, I apologize for having some difficulties here at the end. Um, not as much of a, a question as just a comment uh, that has to do with the George's Bank cod measures. There was many from the Cape and the island and the south coast, that, as well as farther south in the other states, that were disappointed in the fact that August had to be shut down. Um, unfortunately, that month represents the, the highest catch of mortality for recreational cod, and, and it corresponds to the tourist season in 
buy many more of those strips to go. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, those measures had to be implemented in order to uh, do what needed to be done to protect the stock. But um, you know, I just wanted to mention that because I, I don't think we have any alternative to, to make that work. Um, I, I did have some questions about black sea bass and scup. If you, if you want me to throw that out here now or, or wait a few minutes to, if I can, hopefully. Well, Michael, can we come back to that? Let's let Melanie answer no, questions works. on her subject matter. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Ray. Appreciate it. Thank you. Questions for Melanie from Commissioner. Khalil? Khalil, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Jared. And uh, once again, uh, for both Melanie and for Nicola, compliments on how you can keep all of this information. And, and it's sometimes it can be very complex how you can keep it all straight and, and, and what's in, you know, the, the way you deal with it and the way you present it. It's uh, it really is incredible. I appreciate it. Um, Melanie, regarding the uh, 2022 uh, trip level for, um, for the scallops, um, is that, does that reflect a larger number of harvesters um, in, in that number? That, not, such a drastic number from 2021. Is, is there any kind of, any any figures as to how the, is it effort? Is it uh, a slightly larger number of harvesters, a, a larger number of harvesters? But it seems like a phenomenal growth from the previous year. Yeah, uh, Khalil, thanks for the question. And actually, you know, while I said that the management measures aren't attached, and we'll have to deal with that later, council staff Sam Ashy in particular. Uh, put together a great kind of background document that I'd be happy to share with you that can give you some uh, insights into that in terms of each of the permit categories and what's happening. It's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of everything, right? Uh, permit holders that have been fishing that in the in the past, which are Northern Gulf of Maine, Incidental, IFQ, uh, they have grown and have uh, increased their average number of trips. Uh, but you also have a few. Uh, I don't want to say new entrants, but uh, you've had you've had new permits being activated that weren't there maybe in the last two or three years. Not a not a huge number, if I recall. There was only like three or four uh, in terms of some of the dual permit holders. But I'd be like I said, there, there's about a six page document that can give you some more insight into that from council staff, and I'd be happy to share that with you. Thank you. It seems like an incredible number, and and I know you have your hardcore harvesters that that they do this all the time and then is this you know are the others that are jumping in just diluting their profit um and it really is an interesting figure and you know i'd like to learn a little bit more about it sure yeah and it, you know it's a, it's an interesting one it's not an easy one to come to some um statement about, well, this is who should and shouldn't, because in, uh, when Amendment 21 did kind of refigure uh, uh, the Northern Gulf of Maine fishery and and brought that biomass into uh, what's known as the ACL flow chart there, you know, it was anticipated that growth, uh, that there would be growth and that would be there would be growth across all permit categories. It's just how to do that. Um, and that was partly, partly um, affected by giving that 600,000 set aside what's called the Northern Gulf of Maine set aside. And that that's primarily for the Northern Gulf of Maine permit holders before you start growing the other categories. So again, I, uh, I'll, I'll pass along that additional information and happy to talk further later. And once again, Melanie, thank you. Yep. Lou Williams. Lou, you're recognized. Uh, yeah, just a couple questions on the scallops, uh, Melanie. I listened into that last meeting, and um, with that control, they just, you know, obviously it's just a control day right now, but just food for thought is, let's say they use a control day two years from now, and someone has switched their LAGC to a Northern Gulf of Maine. Do they go, you know, I just, just so, uh, you know, you know, you, you don't want to lose your permit. Uh, hopefully you'll be able to revert back to what you were before. That's my, my first question, you know, and, and like I said, I know it's not really a question. It's just a comment because uh, mm -hmm. nothing's really been done, you know, right, um, and, right. the, you know, and the, uh, the second question is, uh, I, I don't know if it's ever been brought up, but it's always kind of bothered me. I, I have an LAGC permit with quota on it. And that quota was derived from 
the biomass south of the 42 degree line. That's where it used to be before they moved it up to the 4220 to designate between the scarlet fishery, south, southern scarlet fishery of the northern Gulf of Maine. So with the overall, having the LADC, I come up to the northern Gulf of Maine to fish above the 4220. There's an overall quota for all boats involved. We all have very similar interchangeable permits, but I have to use my quota up there that wasn't derived from that area when it was initially given out. So I, I wonder um, if that's ever been brought up in any of the scholarship meetings. You know, I think uh, it's kind of like double taxation. You know, you got your quota from down south, but you got to use it up north when no one else has to use a quota. You know, they just get a daily trip limit. You know, so that's always yeah, kind of bothered me. You know. Sure. Yeah, that southern boundary of the northern Gulf of Maine that that has come up. I mean, that came up uh, explicitly during the Amendment Twenty One discussion. Ultimately, it was something that we didn't want to reconfigure. But I'll I'll say if you look at the management priority list for scallops, uh, not what was prioritized this year, but in terms of you know we always keep a list above and below the line, and there there is a ton of northern Gulf of Maine uh, specific items, whether you're talking about IFQ trip limits in there or that boundary or, you know, it, 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 <clears throat> there there's a lot of um, interest in continued refinement of how scouts are managed in the northern Gulf of Maine. So, um, you know, I could, I, that possibly could be something that ends up being part of the management priorities mm -hmm. in future years. Mm, okay. Yeah. It just, like I said, it's just something that's, I've always, went, uh, you know, you just feel like you're getting double taxed, you know, mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, but, uh, okay. Well, that's about it then. Thank you, Melanie. Yeah, you're welcome. Lou. Thank you, Lou. Questions for Melanie? I'm not seeing any other hands raised, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much, Ms. Griffin. Uh, can we come back to uh, Nicola before we move on to protected species? Michael Peer knock has a question or two for Nicola on black sea bass. Mike? Uh, thank, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, and thank you, Nicola, for running with this, moving with this, coming up with different options um, for black sea bass to scup. Uh, hopefully there'll be a mechanism to accommodate the shoreside anglers, to recreational anglers, as well as the four hire fleet. Um, it, it's, with, with what's on that black sea bass uh, slide, they're the options that are presently before us and what's in red just may have adjustments in the timelines associated with it. Right. Everything in, in red um, was what was a change from status quo. Um, the asterisks identify season ending dates that may need to be tweaked a little bit. So for each of these options, we were looking at moving the season start date up a day. So it was still on a Saturday um, and we just need to fine tune the end date for some of those for some of those seasons. So I, I think it would be, you know, within a, a couple of days for all the ones that said 9-4, September 4th, I think it's a, probably a, just a, ma a couple of days difference. Um, the two that had an October 15th date for the private and shore modes, that could be, you know, a, a week or two difference. Um, but I'll have that information um, in time for the scoping meeting. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that la last option there is interesting because it's accommodating the, the different, uh, you know, gear types per se, the, the wreck uh, shore side, the wreck uh, on the bed, on a boat and the four hire and the need for, you know, it's been mentioned in the past, it was mentioned in last year, previous years, the need for the four hire to at least have a four fish bag limit. So uh, it's positive to see that. Uh, just, just one other question. I, don't, I certainly wouldn't do this for scum because I don't think there's any trophy fishery for scum, but maybe there is. But it, is, is there any option that there would be a, a uh, like we just did with TOG, something similar to that for black sea bass that maybe could uh, address or accommodate this 10% reduction and we do the same for black sea bass? Um, I, I had some discussion with staff about, about that idea. And... Um... We, we didn't end up pursuing it very far. Generally speaking, a, a slot limit is intended to protect 
you know, spawning female fish and given the life history of sea bass, that would, it would have the um, opposite consequence of having, having the, um, a slot limit. Um, and there's already some kind of some unknowns and implications of the management given the uh, life history of, of this species. So given just needing to make this 10% reduction right now, we decided not to pursue that. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. Appreciate your work. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Michael. Thank you, Nicola. We're going to move along now to protected species management updates. Ray, I've got this one. I've got just four brief items I want to present. Um, Bob Glenn wasn't able to join us today. Um, the first is I've issued a letter of authorization for the National Marine Fisheries Service uh, Northeast Fishery Science Center gear specialists to conduct some ropeless fishing using a handful of boats in uh, specific portions of Mass Bay and also a, a one little location down off of um, uh, south of Cuttyhunk. And I know uh, this is a controversial issue. I know that in the past uh, we have um, kind of raised a pretty high bar on this activity going on in state waters, but I hope you've seen the letter that we wrote. Um, you know, we do have some concerns, but I wanted to um, assist them in some of their research because working some of these gear systems close to shore is extremely convenient, uh, logistically um, uh, possible and enhances the chances of conducting some of these experiments. Um, as a, you know, in our letter we did uh, sort of state on the record that we don't think that this is going to necessarily be needed in state waters, but if they need state waters in order to, um, you know, conduct these, these trials um, for convenience, uh, I didn't, I wanted to assist them in the development of this gear. I'm fairly confident that uh, the gear itself is going to have enormous consequences for our inshore fishery and the vast majority of our inshore fishery participants would prefer to have a um, the seasonal closure and the weak rope and um, as opposed to uh, you know a, a ropeless fishing mandate which small boat operators absolutely can't uh, are un unlikely to be able to um, to meet because of the cost. Um, you know, guys who fish in small boats fish either singles or short trawls. And if you consider each of these devices costs about $4,000, it doesn't take a lot of math to realize it's going to be extraordinarily expensive for them to participate. So anyway, I just wanted uh, folks to know that. And if you wanted to discuss that uh, further with me, I, I would be happy to do that. Um, the next issue I wanted to talk about is the omnibus uh, bill that was enacted. I kind of made reference to this in our December meeting because it was in progress. But in the federal spending bill that was enacted in December, there was uh, an amazing uh, piece of it that had to do with establishing a six-year pause on any new regulations uh, concerning the Endangered Species Act or the Marine Mammal Protection Act uh, when it comes to uh, conserving right whales. It, in essence, it, it stated that the American lobster fishery was going to be uh, it was going to be deemed uh, in compliance with the plan, which in essence gives that fishery a, a six-year pass. And this was um, this was commandeered and, and promoted by the state of Maine primarily. Um, in the end, uh, it has some real benefits for us because I think it gives us a few more years of data collection. Uh, because you know, a lot of folks feel that the NIMS models uh, and, the, and the assumptions going into the um, the assessments of 50% uh, mortality attributable to Massachusetts, I'm sorry, to U.S. fishing gear, um, is putting the onus on the uh, our domestic fisheries. And many in the industry insist that because of the, the relocation of whales uh, up to Canada, um, that that's where a lot of the new mortalities are occurring. So it gives us a chance to collect data um, on this important issue. It also gives us a chance to work on some of the uh, other issues like ropeless fishing and weak rope and also to determine if our weak rope options are working and I'm pleased to report that uh, there has been some uh, new entanglements this year, but um, the, none of them are in uh, US gear uh, documented yet there was two 
whales uh, that were uh, documented in Canadian gear that were um, that were seen in the United States. So that's that's really encouraging. Um, I also want to mention that in, in for right whales, we um, we have seen up to a couple dozen already in the Cape Cod Bay area. And some of those whales have also been seen in subsequent surveys down at the bottom of Nantucket Shoals. So there is movement between those two habitats. Uh, the flight that just took place uh, yesterday by the National Marine Fishery Service uh, found um, 19 right whales at the bottom of Nantucket Shoals. This is about 15 miles south of Nantucket. It's nowhere near state waters. It's fairly close to the shipping lane, which is kind of uh, disconcerting, but nonetheless, um, we're getting better information. I also should mention that this uh, six year pause that was built into the spending bill also gave um, a lot of money to states to uh, collaborate and to develop um, other research uh, plans to help identify the, the times and places that whales are around. That was a big uh, goal of the state of Maine because they uh, they feel that they don't, they simply don't have as many right whales in their fishery uh, co-occurring with their fisheries and they they feel that they were being uh, unnecessarily targeted uh, with new regulations so we'll be working uh, collaboratively with them to come up with uh, new detection methods and and also uh, likely fully fund our surveillance programs and then uh, the last thing i want to mention is that there is a uh, there's a, a closure that is somewhat controversial. It's known as the Mass Bay Wedge. I don't know if Jared or or Julia can throw that up on the screen, but um, Matt Bass had mentioned it in his comments. There was an area that was that was um, uh, created uh, or left open between the the Mass Bay restricted federal closure and the state waters closure, and it's a it's a it's a, a narrow uh, corridor of open area that unfortunately um, was left open and some lobstermen you know, took advantage of it by instead of bringing the gear home, put it into this open area. Um, you know, if, Given the objectives of that closure, there really wasn't any rational reason to leave that open. Um, I know the MLA was very frustrated when NIMS went forward and closed it with literally uh, no notice or um, one day's notice. And I believe there's a there's an ongoing suit about that. And there was a there's also arguments as to whether uh, such an action is allowed to be taken under the federal spending plan, which um, which many thought meant that there wouldn't be any new regulations uh, for for another six years on these fisheries. But there was in the omnibus spending bill there was some language that attempted to um, allow NIMS to uh, to uh, finalize so-called emergency actions. I believe that this is what was intended. So on the screen, you can see the uh, green area that uh, is east of Boston. That's the area in question. That area was left open. And like I said, our surveillance uh, flights were seeing um, you know, a fair amount of gear there and, and whales, especially in the later part of the season in, the, in last year uh, and the year prior. And that was um, primarily in March and April. So it is controversial. It is a very uh, frustrating outcome for the Massachusetts lobstermen. I know that many of them, you know, uh, were probably watching the the state of Maine get a, a six year pause and any new rules. And here comes the NIMS rule um, targeting primarily the Massachusetts lobstermen. But um, we have a lot of concerns about leaving that area open, uh, especially as whales are leaving uh, in the month of April. Um, so anyway, it is the focus of a, of a suit, and I believe there's going to be a hearing this Thursday on it. I've written a declaration that kind of uh, puts on the record the fact that that in my capacity as director, I have requested NIMS to consider uh, enacting this or to reenact it from last year. And uh, I may be called on to uh, to to in some capacity um, during that that trial. And it's a trial to get a preliminary injunction uh, to get the rule thrown out. So um, those are the four issues I wanted to just give you on um, on this. The, the last one uh, just comes to mind is the incidental take permit, which which we developed that application over about a year and a half to two years. Uh, just as we were submitting it to the service, this omnibus went into place. And so at this point, um, it's been it's on a pause and we're asking our attorney general's office to uh, to give us um, kind of some advice as to whether we should submit it or to hold it back. 
depending on the legal interpretation of that omnibus amendment and, and what it means for state managed fisheries. So I'll stop there. There's five issues I've covered. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer those. Questions for the director. Jared. Matt Bass. Matt, you're recognized. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yeah, so something I might have I forgot to mention maybe earlier, but part of part of our efforts in removing some of the skiers, is we're looking for um it's it helps if we see corresponding gear loss reports. Um which you know gives us any we we can generally tell if gear is been damaged or storm uh, moved around by storm or or vessel traffic, but if it's still right where we think they left it, um there might be some issues there. So if we're recommending that um that people file gear loss reports and that hopefully there's a mechanism with DMF to kind of um accurately track that so we can um can reference those. Um one other issue somewhat not related to this, but a DMF did put out a, a kind of a reminder and advisory for clarification on offshore lobsters, uh, offshore draggers that um, are targeting lobsters. And um, that has become a bit of an issue in the last couple of weeks. So if there were any other questions for that, I can, we can um, clarify that, but that was a, that was appreciated for that, that clarification. That's all. Thank you, Matt. Thanks. Lou? Lou Williams. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, Dan, I just, when you were talking about the uh, Mass Bay uh, ropeless testing and uh, giving them permission, don't forget there's going to be scholars like me up there this winter and spring. So, um, you know, yeah, Lou, we, Lou, we, thanks. You in know, we kind of go up there. Yeah. No, I get that. And in our letter, we pointed out to the National Fishery Service that even as they're, um, trying to solicit, you know, fishermen to fish ropeless and doing this, it's, we're saying, you know, you've got a real problem with, with potential gear conflicts. I think for the most part, they're working with these, uh, this handful of lobstermen and they're convinced they can find little pieces of bottom that are less likely to, to result in these gear conflicts. But I would be really anxious to hear, um, you know, what, if you, if you know of guys fishing in, in what is essentially the, the path of where you want to fish, without there being any um, uh, insufficient notification or for that matter, insufficient resolution about uh, who's responsible for any kind of gear conflict. Well, that's, that's, I, that's my, that's my concern. I get into one of these, you know, these ropeless trawls and is it my fault is, you know, <laughs> you know, it's, so they got to take that into consideration. I think right now they're just going along with, Oh, well, it's, it's closed. There's nobody out there. So, but that's right. not the case. And I know there's going to be a few other boats, you know, that I know will be up there. So. Yeah. Um, and Lou, the way I see it, this they're, they're kind of setting themselves up for a little bit of failure because I don't think it's hard to, for guys close to shore to communicate to the local draggers because they kind of, they're up, they know each other, right. They're out of the same port, but as you move this, this concept further and further offshore, you know, you could have North Carolina scallopers, you know, fishing, you know, 12 yeah. miles offshore and, and, you know, you don't know who they are. And so it's, this is, this right. is what, what, this is one of the biggest problems in my mind of, of this being successful is that it is, they haven't figured this out yet. I mean, yes, there are proposed solutions, something about cloud-based, um, you know, uh, plot, you know, plotting of the information that that all boats could have access to, but it's that's that hasn't been resolved yet. So we're we're many many years away from final, uh, you know, like finally mastering that technology. But that's the vision that some of these folks have, and I just thought it would be better to um, let them. Uh, work on some limited scale to sort of learn, you know, to and demonstrate what these challenges are instead of just saying, you know, no all the time. So it makes more sense to to let this this proceed for demonstration purposes, even if what's demonstrated are, are the challenges. And I don't want anybody to get hurt. I don't want anybody to lose gear. So I'll make sure that we publicize where this gear is. But as a solution for wide scale adoption, um, you know, it, it, it's very uh, questionable at this time. Well, and then and a question on that, what you just said is they'll pu publish where the gear is going to be. So now they get to, 
like the windmills get their their piece of bottom. <laughs> you know what I mean? And they they could be putting it right in where we want to go scalloping. And sure, that's not, and that's, that's not fair. Yeah, and that's one of the things I've tried to explain to some of the lobster interests is that, you know. It, what would prevent mobile gear interest from proposing some lobster free zones? And at that point, we're, the, we're gonna, the, the vision is to zone the ocean. And that, that could be just the, the, an unexpected um, complication. So, yeah. So again, this is, this is 2023, this, this five boats working with the gear researchers and uh, we'll see where it goes, but I'm hopeful that with all of the, 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 the new, the new, the time that we've been, gifted the two three four five years of data collection um you know maybe we find that that they're that what's plaguing right whales isn't uh, isn't the u.s gear you know, especially since we've gone to the weaker gear and the uh and the closures you know maybe maybe it's uh right. maybe it is a canadian problem so we'll see yeah okay thanks dan thank you lou jared any other questions for dan Sure, we have uh, Lieutenant Bass again. Yeah, uh, in, in reference to that, um, the ropeless gear, I did see an email um, recently about, uh, I think Edge Tech's putting out that app for trap tracker. Um, I, I don't know if, if that's also capturing some of these um, um, initial efforts, but I, I was a little disappointed to see it actually cost $25. Um, was interested in trying it, but um, I don't know, if, is that supposed to be working for our ropeless? trials yeah uh, thanks matt yes um it should be and I, and I will make sure that uh bob and his team um you know reach out to the science center folks down at woods hole and loop you guys in because i think that was one of the one of the recommendations so the the begs is for for them to be working with you guys as well yeah trap tracker is is a piece of software that when the trap goes overboard the fisherman is is able to punch in uh, that location and then the location of the trawl you know each end um, then gets shared or goes into a database and gets shared with other folks who are subscribing to this and yeah this it's theoretical and um, folks are working hard on it um, but clearly it's it's not fully developed yet but that is the the second half of the solution that that people envision one is you know the, the gear can we know that the gear is pretty reliable bringing the buoys to the to the surface but as far as um, sharing the information and preventing gear conflicts uh, that's a real work in progress Mike yeah. here. Michael you recognize Hello, can you hear me? Yes, Mike. Oh, excellent. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to expand on the ropeless gear, Melanie mentioned it earlier. Me and the Rec and Four Hire Fleet are providing input also because we have the same concerns. We need to know and understand where they're located and try to avoid them. So, um, yeah, we're in ongoing discussions. It's consistent with what we already heard in the call. I, I just wanted to make sure all were aware. So it's commercial gear types, more of the four higher that may be out for earlier in the year than the rec guys, but um, just want to make sure everybody aware of that. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Any other hands, Jared? Suki. Suki, Suki, you recognize. Jared? I can hear you, Suki. Okay, I switched over to my phone. Thank you. Hey, Dan, uh, Unless I missed it, I didn't see the you know the letter of authorization and the map and everything. Could you send that out to the commission members at least? Yes, we will. Okay, yeah, just people have been asking where they're gonna fish, and unless I missed it, I haven't seen it. So, I'd like you know, everybody to see it. Thanks. Thank you, Suki. Any other questions? I'm not seeing any additional hands raised, Mr. Chair. Let's move on to public petitions. Dan? Jared, you want to take these? I'll take the first one. Take the, I'll uh, take the first one because I've been more involved yep. in that one. Um, so back in 
Um, late November of last year, we received a public or we were sent a public petition that we did not receive until early this year from the Dartmouth Saltwater Anglers. Um, and they want, they are requesting DMF examine the impact of the black sea bass pot fishery on the Tatog resource. Um, they're particularly concerned about the uh, regulatory discarding of large Tatog that may get caught in a uh, black sea bass pot. And they're asking DMF to consider reducing the um, heads on mandatorily reducing the head size on black sea bass pots to prevent to tog over three and a half or four pounds from entering, um, prohibit to tog fishermen from, or prohibit black sea bass potters from landing any to tog, um, and reducing the overall number of black sea bass pots allowed. Uh, we're not going to take any action on this this year. Um, in, in order to take any action on this, we'd have to have a better understanding of the statement of the problem um, in terms of, you know, how many sea bass are being dis or how what extent this to tog discarding is problematic and is occurring and we don't have the sea sampling um ability to do that right now our to tog indices are strong um so we're given resources and the status of the to tog um in massachusetts waters we're not going to take any action on this this year uh, we'd open discuss. We'd invite discussion from commission members on this, uh, but at this time, that is how we're going to respond to this petition. Khalil, Khalil, you're recognized. Khalil, Khalil. you're. I'm on my Mac Pro. Things don't always work the way I want them. Uh, I'm just curious about the. Um, this this uh, this group from we're we're we're, we're entertained a, a petition from the Darth and the Saltwater Anglers, uh, and it, it only had the, the letter that was presented only had two names on it. Is this just coming from just two individuals, or is there actually a a uh, an organization called the Dartmouth Saltwater Anglers? There is a organization of um, anglers down on in Buzzards Bay that that are affiliated with this. It's a it's a small organization of commercial and recreational anglers who principally target those south coast bottom fish species, scuff, sea bass, to tog, summer flounder, uh, and, and you know they've been involved and in, and in, and in present in public discourse on on the management of these species in years past. Thank you, Jared. Thank you, Khalil. Any other questions for Jared? If Mike, not, you're Michael, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, but uh, as requested, you information. Uh, as I read the letter, I was confused whether they were talking about traps, pots, trawls. It, it was a little confusing to me. It wasn't exactly clear. So. Yes, I agree. Get a little bit more clarification um, of what gear types they're specific to or their concern is. Thank you. Yeah, my my understanding in speaking with Pete Kelly, who is or who goes by Walter Kelly in this in this letter, but he's known to us as Pete Kelly. Um, I spoke with him after we received this, and and he indicated that he was talking about while well, they use the term black sea bass trawl industry, they were talking about the pot fishery. Um, but I mean, there's other questions as to, you know, the scale of this problem, the scale of discarding, um, you know, what gear modifications to black sea bass pots, the, the impacts of that on, you know, black sea bass catch as well as to tog catch, um, that, that would need far more research to, to, um, to begin to understand if we can even address this through, through regulation. All right, Dan, to the second yeah um there was a trade show a couple of weekends ago down in westport and i think this this generated some interactions between some some um, constituents and our staff and you know lo and behold uh, the day after this trade show uh, we get a, a request from a local uh, commercial fisherman a straight bass fisherman who wants us to uh, move the opening day of bass season much earlier. Uh, we've already mailed you my response. I, I just wanted to 
uh, nip it in the bud because for a few reasons. One, uh, we, we don't have the bandwidth. You, The commission has seen all the work that went into the proposals for, you know, Menhaden, Stripe, uh, uh, sea bass, scup, uh, fluke, and of course, horseshoe crabs, we are straight out with some really uh, difficult issues. Um, and as far as striped bass goes, um, this is the first we heard of it, and and we we uh, we probably need an extra three months to uh, to take that on, just like we've been spending the last three months on some of those other issues. But also, um, we did give the the anglers in that area uh, a one week earlier opening in our last round of striped bass amendments, which you, many of you on the commission voted on, and. Um, the net result of all those changes, uh, we did close the fishery in early August this past year, and that's certainly not uh, one of our intended outcomes. We'd like to see that fishery go through the summer season. So um, it, it wouldn't be something that I would recommend we, we take on. And, um, and we just want to let you know that we're, we're, we're trying to be responsive, not only to the constituent, but uh, to the, to the Senator, Senator Roderick's aide who followed up as well. And, and he was satisfied with the information. We're able to, to um, dig up the, the past uh, memos on this issue. And, um, and, and I think that uh, is, is going to be sufficient for now. Thank you, Dan. Questions for Dan? Mike Beardnock? Michael, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Dan. Um, you know, I agree. Uh, after this came out, you got the old, you know, those reaching out from the north versus the south and trying to do the balance and act. So uh, agree with uh, how you're proceeding. I, I do have a question, and it has to do with the science. If, if I understand things properly, what's changed over, year, over the years in our waters is that we historically now see more stripers from the Hudson River, uh, where back you know, 20, 30 years ago, they were primarily from um, the Chesapeake. Is, is there science that shows that the early runs as well as the late runs consist of, or later in the season, consist of one stock or the other? As there's a lot of uh, um, talk on the water about the early runs being uh, more of the Hudson River runs and then the, the more midsummer later runs um, being from the Chesapeake. I, I was curious if yeah. there's science to support that. Well, Mike, the science is being worked on by Ben Gehagen of our, our Gloucester staff, uh, and he's presented uh, to this group. I don't know if there's a time series that could reliably describe historical contributions uh, in our fishery to the to the various um, uh, spawning or producing areas, but I would certainly be willing to ask Ben to attend a future commission meeting and and weigh in on some of those issues. He's uh, pursuing a, a doctoral dissertation on those questions or, or the the techniques to um, to delineate those uh, those stocks within our fishery. So. I do not have an answer to that question, but I know someone who could probably uh, present the latest and greatest intel on that. Uh, that, that would be great. And um, it seems as though the farther south you go to the Southern states, there seems to be more of those that believe that that's the case. And I hear some of that up here, but uh, that would be great if there's anything there to support or reject that theory. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Dan. Any other questions for Dan on these public petitions? If not, we're going to move on. I'm not seeing any other hands raised. Okay, under other business, I'm going to go around the table, starting with Bill Doyle. Bill Doyle, any closing comments? No, I'm all set, Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Bill Amaru, closing comment. Oh, thank you, Ray. Oh, just another very informative and uh... Uh, well attended meeting and looking forward to the next couple of months when we start making hard decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Suki Sawyer, closing comment. Yeah, thanks, Ray. I couldn't speak earlier. I wanted to ask Dan on that uh, compensation uh, committee meeting that was held for Boehm. Is that going to be a 
government based commission or is it, they're going to farm it out to a you know an industry based uh group thanks that's a good question Suki. it's we're thinking of like a, a like a non-profit third-party entity that would would be paying out the funds but with some kind of uh oversight but that's that's the kind of issues that have to be resolved. And I believe there are some industry folks who have been invited down to this meeting uh, that I'll be attending as well. Okay, so thanks. right now, like with those two projects, uh, we have one for, called Vineyard Wind and another South Fork, uh, although the South Fork power is going over to, um, to Rhode Island. Uh, in each of those cases, there's a third party entity that is going to be spending out the money with, with some level of oversight. And, you know, we're thinking that we need a much larger one to do all of these, as opposed to uh, like the, the government being handled, handed a check and, and for them to work it out. Because honestly, um, when, when we're trying to mitigate, I'm sorry, we're trying to compensate uh, individual fishing businesses for their participation in a federal fishery, you know, we need coordination. You know what I mean? It's, it shouldn't be up to a, 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 like a state official to decide what the impacts are to a, uh, to a, a fishing vessel or fishing business that's con being conducted primarily in the federal zone. So we need, we need more broadly applied um, guidelines to this. And I think that's what we're hoping for. Okay, thanks. I just, Hate to see when there's a more the bigger the pile of money gets to be, the more people seem to come out of the woodwork with ex so-called expertise on what the issues are. Well, okay, I think thanks. I think the just to to address that, Suki, that's an important point. I think the hope is that there's oh, there's going to be limits to how much this entity could spend on itself, and maybe even uh, it would some of that would come from the interest earned once the money was put into those accounts. But uh, that is one of the concerns that that everybody has is is the uh, the the uh, the costs associated with the entity have to be kept in check. Okay, thanks for that, Dan. Nothing else, Ray. Thank you. Thank you, Suki. Michael Piernock. Closing comment. I'm good. Thank you, Michael. Lou Williams. Closing comment. Yeah, all set, Ray. Thanks. Thank you, Lou. Shelly Edmondson. Closing comment. No comments. Thanks, Ray. Thank you, Shelley. Khalil, closing comment? No comments. Thank you. Thank you, Khalil. So now I'm going to open this to the public. As we move along here, we are on time constraints. This is neither a scoping hearing nor a public hearing. So as you raise your hand and you recognize, please identify yourself and whether you you're speaking on behalf of a group or as an individual. So I'll turn it over to Jared. Jared, have you got hands raised? Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. So um, if you're in the attendee, uh, members of the public, please use the hand function. That'll create a queue um, and I'll recognize you. Uh, we have short time left of this meeting, so please keep comments concise. Again, this isn't a public hearing or a public scoping meeting just an opportunity to, to raise any comments you might have about issues discussed today or other issues the commission should consider. So I'll begin with Eric. Eric, you've been recognized. You can unmute yourself. Hello. Hello. Good morning, Eric. Uh, so I'm one of the uh, Manhattan Saners and uh, just the comments I have for now are, I'm getting my fish hold surveyed, try to uh, preemptively for the new Manhattan rules. Uh, the guy's coming on Thursday. It's gonna be about $900. Uh, when I broke down, it's about 40 pounds of Manhattan per cubic foot. So I'm hoping it comes out to be 625 cubic feet for my fish hold survey. Uh, the other comment is with the e-trips on my phone from, to fill out before I land is a little confusing for me. So I don't know if we can come up with a, uh, a YouTube or uh, some sort of meeting to try to help us figure that out. And the other one was uh, Buzzards Bay being closed to sanings. Uh, if in the future there's ever the fish don't come north of Cape Cod, it'd be nice to look at Buzzards Bay because of New Bedford as a strategic position for people to unload and the fact that 
there's only five active inshore net seining permits that I don't see there being a big issue of uh, complications of us being in there since it's 250 square miles. So just to possibly in the future, look at that. If ever fish don't go north of Cape Cod again, I, I, I would like to, you know, not permanently shut that door, but be able to look at it in the future if things change. And uh, that's all I got. It's just the survey, Buzzard Bay, and the help trying to figure out the uh, e-trips landings before I land. All right. Thank you, Eric. And yeah, we'll be doing education and outreach on uh, you know, the electronic reporting before we implement that for anyone we implement it for for 2024. So, okay. We're talking to you more on this in public hearing. Thank you. Brett Hoffmeister, you're next. Uh, thank you, Jared. Thank you, everybody, for, for listening. Um, my name is Brett Hoffmeister. I'm the LAL Production Manager, Associates of Cape Cod. And I just want to commend the state on, on what is clearly a, a well-thought-out plan. But um, I do have comments regarding the logistics. I mean, these these are some pretty pretty big changes to the way the fishery is managed. I understand that, uh, you know, this is for, for the benefit of conservation. Uh, the state's done a great job managing this fishery. We've seen the result of that and the increases in many indices and, and, and populations uh, appear to be growing on the beaches as well as like trawl net surveys, et cetera. Um, you know, the changes that are proposed also present us with some logistical challenges that I, I hope the state can be sensitive to. Uh, about 75% of my temporary staff is hired before June 1st and undergoes a lot of training during that time. Uh, these these proposals will present some some real challenges there uh, for us at ACC. Um, secondly, you know we've been we've been working this fishery and working with the state for just about fifty years now, and um, this fundamentally changes the, the way we do business, and that includes business with our vendors. And our vendors, as you know, include fishermen and dealers for both biomedical and bait. Um, you know, I. I I, I worry for some of these guys, particularly the beach harvesters, where 50% of the bait crabs are coming in from the beach. Um, you know, the impact to some of our vendors here is unknown at this time. I've yet to receive any feedback from them, but uh, I am sensitive to their needs. Uh, they've, they've been good, good, reliable vendors for us for, for a long time. Um, so the arrival of the the new entity is, has, has created some um, concern, and, and uh, I understand that. But I also hope that the state can be sensitive to um, the needs of the industry that has existed for the past 49 years in, in, this, in this business and uh, working with, with the fishermen uh, to manage, help manage this fishery in a sustainable manner. That's all for me. Thank you. Thank you, Brett. Moving on, Jared. Phil Coates, you can unmute yourself, Phil. Phil, you're still muted. Phil, you're still muted. Mr. Chair, it appears that Phil Coates is still muted. I don't know how you want to proceed. Proceed, Jared. Call on the next hand. He's the last one. Well, Phil, sorry once again. I'm going to call for a motion to adjourn. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? I'll make the motion, Ray. Thank you. Dr. Evans. that. Who Bill is that? Doyle. Bill Doyle. Thank you, Bill. No, is anybody opposed to the motion? I'm not seeing any oppositions, Mr. Chair. This meeting's adjourned. Thank you very much for your attendance.